All right, I think we are officially rolling. Man, we got a big one lined up here. I am here with some of the rock stars in our uh, world of gymnastics for all things nutrition. How is everyone doing? Everyone doing well? Yeah, doing great. Yeah, thanks for having us, Dave. We have California, we have Georgia, we have New York, we have Boston. We're, we're spreading across the country to get this going and coordinating time between four busy professionals who have real working lives and families is it's pretty much impossible. So thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so let's, um, it's, it's actually, we're just bantering before the podcast, but I think it's really important that we're having this conversation and, and this just to date this podcast appropriately. This is coming out after Athlete A has been promoted and has rightfully so shaken the world of gymnastics. And it is also coming out in the middle of many, many athletes coming forward and, and discussing and highlighting some really troublesome and concerning patterns of, of talks around nutrition and body image and weight and, and practices that have been going on for the last 20 years, let's be frank, that have been complained about or brought to an attention, but it just really have not been addressed fully the way they should. And so I think it's a perfect serendipitous moment for us to um, have a conversation that's hard um, and that's honest about some of the things that are concerning in our, in our culture. But as we were saying before the, po the podcast started, we really want to present the science of what's going on, why these things are maybe a little bit off the rails. And we have some papers that we're going to share. I'll share on screen. But we also want to really give people hope. We want to try to spin this in a way that's like there's a good way to do this and there's a way to make this positive and move forward so that people who are in the trenches every day, coaches, medical providers, parents, whatever it is, athletes themselves, feel like there's a, a better light on the other side of this tunnel. And it's not just this doom and gloom. So um, let me introduce everybody first, because I'm sure that um, some people haven't heard of you guys, but you guys are also all amazing. and I want to make sure we talk about it. So first, Christina Anderson is a board certified pediatric and adolescent specialist and a registered dietitian sports nutritionist specializing in nutrition for the high level gymnasts, especially those with disordered eating and body image issues. She helps gymnasts find food, freedom and elite performance. And you also are the owner of Christina Anderson RDN, which is virtual nutrition coaching practices that serves the athletes across the nation. Amazing. Josh Eldridge, uh, a board certified diplomat of American chiropractic boards and sports physicians, founder of Gymnast Care, phenomenal resource for those that don't know that for athletes, parents, author of Because She's Worth It, a nutritional guide to parents with daughters, and also shout out, served in the army and did two tours in, uh, abroad. So extra bonus for that, for being awesome. Um, and then we have Jason Mikowski, who is a board certified sports dietitian and exercise physiologist, works with Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Also shout out to Dr. Ellen Casey, who is uh, one of the top medical providers for the US on the senior national team. And you guys work very closely hand in hand. Um, and, and you've worked with some of the best of the best in the gymnastics world. But also, I think that you have a really cool perspective because you see it from a medical injury rehab and also a sports performance side. And so we could go on a laundry rap sheet of all the things you guys have done. But the reason I wanted to highlight all of your expertise is because two things. One is you guys are highly academic, highly background and, and certified for what you're doing. But also you guys work in the trenches with gymnasts every day. Like this is not a ivory tower of some random nutrition board in a, in a governing body that isn't attached to gymnastics saying like, well, you guys should try to change things. You guys actively deal with parents and gymnasts and, you know, multiple people having these issues. And obviously uh, my contribution is I make very good omelets and I'm also still a coach. <laughs> That's how I'm going to be helping out in the nutrition side. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so let's do this first. I think there's some cool science to cover, but I first want to go around. We'll kind of go like in the Brady Bunch order that I have, maybe like Jason, Christina, Josh, just to talk about what you guys feel is maybe the biggest, most important issue in the culture of gymnastics right now related to nutrition. And I'll give an example of mine because I think I can speak from the coaching side. I still very much feel as though the biggest issue is there are clearly inappropriate behaviors from coaches and parents and other teammates, honestly, about body image and um, weight versus appearance and performance, right? Like people making ludicrous claims about the way someone looks, the food they're eating or their type of performance based on very little scientific training or very little scientific evidence. Like if you're not literally reading studies by the week, you have zero way to say what should someone eat or why they look a certain way. So I feel that's the biggest issue that we have in our culture is those behaviors are happening, but people are not holding themselves accountable or other coaches are not calling out that trash when it happens. Like, okay, let's pull you into the office. Listen, Hey, that's not how you talk to a kid. And that's not acceptable. This is your first warning. If it happens again, you're going to have reprimands. Like it should be that serious, I think, because those little mm -hmm. things that people pass off in comments as these research studies support. And as we know, completely can ruin someone's psyche. So that's my personal mm -hmm. opinion. Um, Jason, what do you think on either more on that or what you think is maybe the bigger, a bigger issue or another big issue? Yeah. I mean, I think you kind of started talking about, and for me, having watched, watched athlete a and just knowing uh, the sport of gymnastics, 
the biggest thing that I see is that we have to remember we're dealing with kids, right? We're not dealing with 27 year old, you know, professional athletes who are making millions of dollars, who are adults and can make these decisions. They're young, they're impressionable. There's an authority level that the adults have that they're influenced by. That's just at the stage of the game that they're at. And so I think we need to be doubly aware that even a comment made not with malice, just an offhand comment, even when we're not trying to be mean, can sometimes have a different effect, um, let alone those who are actively disparaging uh, kids um, who are trying to, to work their best and do their best. So I think we really need to step back and acknowledge that we're dealing with a whole different ball game here compared to other elite athletes, mm. um, and we have to treat them appropriately. Yeah. Super well said. I agree. And we'll, we're going to expand a lot more on that moving forward with some of these articles, but I agree. Christina, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, just piggybacking off you guys, it, it's the issues of just, you know, hashtag diet culture, which has heavily influenced the sport of gymnastics. And this, as you said, has, has spanned decades and just, you know, there's just so much information on aesthetic versus performance you know, looking at food in the light of good food, bad food. And, and gymnastics is a sport where oftentimes foods are given almost magical powers where, you know, don't eat these foods because they're going to make you fat, ruin your performance. You know, oh, you ate this before practice. And that's why you, you know, fell off the beam four times. And, and young athletes, just like Jason said, their minds, the adolescent brain takes so much of these things in that dichotomous extreme that maybe we don't as adults we understand the intention behind a lot of these comments but unfortunately a lot of these food rules make gymnasts terrified of food they are so guilty about what they eat they're so anxious this results in high level gymnasts who are training five to six hours a day living on nothing but water throughout the practice because they're afraid of looking bloated because then they're called fat. Their coaches call them out for their body shape changing. They're afraid to eat and allow their body to develop. Like there just is a lot of misinformation from coaches, from parents, um, unfortunately from some, you know, even providers that really make this nutrition aspect pretty toxic and unfortunately sparks a lot of disordered eating if not clinical eating disorders which like you said we'll, we'll talk about the stats in a little bit yeah yeah and i agree just to echo before josh goes is i think i want to really make it clear that we don't want to paint all coaches parents and medical providers by the same brush as that it's not everybody maliciously trying to be awful you know no. there are sometimes like nope. you said where someone doesn't realize that that offhanded joke that little side comment is as it holds as much gravity as they mm -hmm. make it when they write it off. And those things, the kid goes home and just sits in their room and, and the wheels turn in a negative. Yep. So don't want to say that everybody in this world is mean and nasty and is coming down to get people. No. I think most people just lack education of how to approach these yeah. things appropriately. So very well, Mr. Josh. All right. So, and Dave gave us this question beforehand. So I've been thinking about this question all week because, um, and Dave, no, Dave's heard my rants multiple, multiple times, like over the past 10 years almost. And so one of the biggest things that I see is that nutrition, it, it's not by itself the only problem in gymnastics. So gymnastics has a whole culture of problems. And I think nutrition goes along with it. And I think that the problems with nutrition are the same problems that we have with training. And so we have to look at this as like a whole picture, not just nutrition. I think nutrition is completely jacked up for most families. And I get to work with, with more dietitians. And so they work, you know, more specifically with some of the more major problems. And I just kind of work on general stuff with the families, working with getting the, the right food in the right, right time. But, but making sure that we look at this as a, as a bigger problem and, and we need to address a lot of these training problems, even going back to why are we practicing four hours a day? Because that's the way we've always done it and it's a way that we can control kids. Mm -hmm. So if the kids aren't at home and they're at the gym, we can control them. And so not only are we controlling their lives, we're controlling, trying to control their diets and everything else that goes along. And we're not thinking outside the box as a sport. And instead, we're, we're, just, we're, we're no different right now going down the same path that Nasser took us down uh, multiple years ago. 
So if we want to stay on this path, we're going to keep having problems and gymnastics isn't going to get out of the rut that they're in. So, um, and you know how I feel about him, Dave. So, yeah, um, I'm sure we all share. There's, the yeah. There's just, there's all sorts of things that are going on that I don't think are, we're, we're not even, we're not even, we're trying to make these like tiny little turns instead of just, you know, whipping the whole ship around and, and get back on course to the, the, the way. And my thought is, is that, uh, and Jason, I think kind of kind of alluded to it, but I think that we don't think of of gymnasts as athletes. We think that they somehow live in their own universe of gymnastics world, right? And they're not subject to the same principles that every other athlete in the world is subject to when it comes to eating mm -hmm. and sleep mm -hmm. and overtraining. We're like, well, they're gymnasts; they can practice twenty six hours a week, and we don't have to worry about the body breaking down. And that's just not the way that it happens. So. Yeah, super well said, and I agree. And I, I can definitely pitch in a little bit here on the coaching side. Then I want to show a very interesting um, coach's report from the study we talked about with a, a selection bias and internal bias people have is I think that you're so right. And, and we have been having these conversations for seven years. Josh and I have been working together, traveling, doing seminars. And I personally always feel like even 10 years ago, everybody is just dancing around the real friggin' issues. You know what I mean? Like there's some stuff that people want to address directly on like gymnasts tear the race a lot. We should figure out how they land. It's like, okay, that one's a little bit obvious when you pay for $80,000 surgery and rehab and you lose your star athlete, right? That one makes sense. But there's other things about like the education system, the, the specialization, the, the lack of strength conditioning principles being used with external loading and mixed hybrid, properly done nutrition, properly done hydration, flexibility principles, you know, all these things at a moral level and a cultural level that it seems as though we all just kind of look slightly off course the other way. And those things just kind of like crept along. But when you pour all those things together, they fill, they fester and they build up and they allow a situation where you have monsters like these, you know, like these NASARs that can infiltrate and take advantage of the fact that the culture is so broken and so messed up because no one's following diverse opinions scientific protocols or having conflicting perspectives like no i actually think we should change that like what do you think about this and not being defensive when they hear criticism so i think that's really important that we're, we're going to talk about some of these issues in the context of like sure science of some of these things but if nothing changes on your cultural level of how you interact with one athlete and what you allow acceptable behavior from the five coaches you work with none of this matters none of the science matters mm -hmm. none of the help with nutritionists matters none of the information you're going to learn do the harder thing when it's the right thing to do you know what I mean? That's my two cents. And I want to show this study first. This is from one of the studies we brought up, but this is, a, uh, for those listening, this is a study that, um, essentially surveyed a bunch of people, coaches, parents, and asked their opinions of diet practices and things of that. And the only thing I want to highlight here, we're going to rip this particle article apart and well, but when they asked coaches, if they, if they report themselves doing these activities or like these negative things, such as weighing people in public or promoting the use of rapid, like diet loss based on aesthetics only all of the coaches said no i don't do that but i've seen a lot of other coaches do it over over half to 75 percent of the coaches said other coaches do it but i don't do it you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that just goes to show you what the internal bias might be is you might not think as a coach as a parent as a medical provider as a gymnast as a friend of a teammate as a support staff who's there at the judging situation whatever you may not think that what you're saying or doing is wrong but according to a lot of these studies, and this is very common to many of the things, everybody sees other people doing it, but doesn't do anything about it. So that's a crazy thing we have to think about is like, okay, if we're not acknowledging that we might be doing something wrong and that like Josh said, we need to turn this ship like 270 degrees on a left-hand turn, not like pivot 10% here with a little media statement or help somebody here who maybe had a problem five years ago. This stuff is, this article is from 2006. This is still going on right now, every day, as of 15 to 20 minutes ago on social media before I log in this podcast. So does anyone have anything to add on this kind of like bucket of change perceptions and things of that nature before we go a little bit more? Um, I just wanted to hop on something you had said earlier about this idea of all these other pieces and then the ACL, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about chronically overtraining, chronically underfueling, you get all those aches and pains, you get under recovered, you get sore, then you start compensating because your knee is hurting or you're, you know, something else is bugging you. You have seizures, you have something else and you're not treating it. So then lo and behold, you overload somewhere else. And then the ripple effect of you tear an ACL. So I think there's so many warning signs that no one listens to and no one takes the ounce of prevention for the pound to cure. And then you have your best athlete with the 20 ACL out for a year 
or less because they want to rush him back. But I think that is the key. If you really listen and address it when you can, because yes, you're going to train hard. There's always going to be a little bit of issues that creep up when you're pushing hard. But if you will listen to it and you address it early and you be sane about it, then you can keep athletes healthier longer. Mm, well said. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else, Christina or Josh, on that? Yeah, I like that. I, I, I love that you're Jason. That you're the um, that you're a movement expert and also a dietitian. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. So, but just thinking about that, I think I agree 100 percent with that. How many times I've been in the gym and seen like kids that are 10 and 11 with knee pain, like even Osgood Slaughters or Cindy Larson Johansson, but patellar tendonitis, whatever. You know, prior to to becoming mature. And, and like you said, those warning signs are there. Same thing with Sievers. I think they're probably outdoing themselves on the floor or, or interacting with the, the mechanism of the, of the floor is, is giving us these warning signs. Hey, this kid probably can't handle this amount of load right now, but, but we just keep going. We're like, oh, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll be all right. <laughs> but they're, yeah. they rarely are. Yeah. Christina? Yeah, I just, I mean, this just speaks to the culture. And I know, like, as a female, it, it is so hard to admit that you're hurting, that something's sore, you don't want to be perceived as weak. And then even just that competitive nature, right? Like for every moment that my competition is is in the gym and I'm not, the young athlete thinks they're just, they're losing, they're missing out, they're going to be behind. And that kind of delayed gratification in terms of being able to rest and recover and take time off in the sense that you will then come back stronger is just something that our our culture doesn't foster. I mean, it took me a long time to learn that. It took me a long time to be okay with 80 to 90% was good enough. Like it didn't have to be 110% all the time. And it's the same with nutrition. You know, we we need to have some breaks in there where we can let off the gas and, you know, enjoy food for what it is instead of this just like 100% perfect diet all the time. And at some point you just, you crack whether it's an injury, an eating disorder, mental issues. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can say for myself, that was something that I had to learn outside of gymnastics and, and really wish that had been addressed, you know, when I was an athlete. And obviously, it, you know, these articles talk about it's that certain personality type, right? Not, not all of us are type A perfectionists, but a lot of us are. And so it's not that gymnastics causes all of this. It's, I think a certain personality is drawn to gymnastics, but yeah, certainly that kind of mental aspect that affects the the physical status as well as nutritional um, is something moving forward that I would just would love to see more and think it would have you know some great kind of carry down effects. Yeah, super well said. And there's there's two points that I kind of want to expand upon there. One is that we do have to recognize that sometimes this is not the coach's pro, not a coach doing the thing that's concerning, right? Sometimes the gymnast is the one who is that like, no, I want to make national team or like, no, I'm trying to get to a college scholarship. And they are the ones who are at 13, 14, 15 are the ones trying to go super hard, super early and are really pushing themselves out. But that's where we have to remember who's the adult in the room, right? Like our job as coaches and as parents and as medical providers is to help protect the athlete from themselves sometimes, right? So that's where a good coach steps in and says like, Hey, like, I know you want to do five more vaults, but your, your techniques falling apart and you look like you're going to, you're going to fall apart like mentally. Right. So we're just going to call it for today. We're going to come back to vault two days tomorrow and we'll do it again. Right. A medical provider does that all the time. I know me and Josh and anybody else do that. It's like, Hey, I know you want to get back now, but like, if we do it now, there's a real high risk of re-injury. Right. And a parent does that all the time. Right. And obviously you guys have kids. I don't. Right. But, um, you can explain to the fact that listen, I know you want to do more. I know you want to go, right? But that's not really the best long-term strategy for you. So, and that builds to my second point is all of us here are on the performance side. We want kids to do well. We want kids to compete super hard, train super hard, get to a scholarship, just go through gymnastics, have fun and move on, right? Like a lot of that stuff. So all of us Mm -hmm. here respect the basic equation that fitness is protective when done in the optimal dose. The problem is, is that in gymnastics culture, the accepted spoken or non-spoken is work plus work plus work equals success. And there's literally no scientific literature that supports that at all. Unless you're an advanced level athlete going through like a super high level training of a shock block and you've earned the right to that. Everything in in that we're going to talk about is work, the optimal dose of work plus the optimal dose of recovery, which nutrition falls under along with sleep and hydration and stress management and stuff. That's where adaptation occurs. So when Josh is talking about why haven't we checked training hours or you guys are talking about why haven't we checked proper ways to look at energy balance and 
not promote a culture where someone's always in a caloric deficit because they have to be skinny or lean. Well, you're putting all of your hard work to waste because there's no recovery adaptation cycle and you're literally blowing someone into the ground. You're just crushing someone over and over. What happens is they don't perform well. It gets back in the gym. Like, oh, you guys really did terrible at the meet or like, man, you, you need to pick it up even if they're not malicious. So they push harder. Right. And it's this constant negative feedback loop where no one ever thinks about maybe one step back gives you a recovery rest period and it was forward. And we just had a three month pandemic. And some of the kids that I'm seeing on Instagram are coming back better because it's the first time they've ever had a real mm -hmm. rest. Right. And Josh is going to yep. jump in here like foaming at the mouth because he's been <laughs> coming for seven years to take an off season. And when I was younger as a, as a less educated coach, I was like, ah, I don't know this Josh guy. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> he's <that> crazy. Right? <laughs> and, and, and Josh, in my defense, Josh was like, Josh wanted like a baseball off season. But I think like a one to two month off season with properly done stuff, take two weeks after your, your peak in the middle of the year. Like it's insane. It's insane. The potential that is left on the table right now in our culture, because we don't respect the real science of super compensation and adaptation cycles. So that's my soapbox. But um, does anyone want to? I love it too. Yeah, on that, Dave, you just kind of said some of all that extra training. But the but the most hilarious thing that to me, whenever I walk into a gym and I see athletes that are super fit and they're very muscular, muscular and they're not incredibly lean, and then I see that they're working out four to six hours a day doing body weight exercises thousands and thousands of times every day, thousands of reps, and they're wondering why their muscles are hypertrophying. So like to me, it just makes me laugh. Like, coach, you're yelling at your kid for being too big, but you're doing this stupid exercise over and over and over again. Their muscles are hypertrophying, and then they're yelling at him, at him some more. Like, like, what do you want them to do? You're creating the, the, the person, and the training is creating the person, but you're getting upset. So... So who's the problem here? The kid that's scared to death or you for, for just doing insane amounts of training instead of doing the proper dose. Mm. Yep. Christina or Jason. Yeah. I mean, I think the Einstein quote is one of the best ones. If you try doing the same thing over and over, we're trying to get different results. You know, that's kind of insanity. So um, yeah, I think, I think it's just so easy in some ways if people are just, like look at sports science and say, okay, gymnastics is a sport. This is what the science says for training and adaptation for any sport. This is how the body adapts and gets stronger and more powerful. Let's apply this science to gymnastics and do it. <laughs> it seems so easy, but clearly it's still an uphill battle given uh, what we're dealing with. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Christina, anything before we move on to this little point number one or? No, I, I agree with them. It's that kind of cultural issue of, but, but we're different. <laughs> that doesn't apply to us because, because we're gymnastics. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Super well said. All right. So we're going to tackle these things in my opinion, in order of most needs to be addressed right now, <laughs> moving down to maybe, um, is still super important, but is also a concern. So the first one that we're going to talk about is, is let's talk about why, uh, comments or coaches discussing, parents discussing, teammates discussing, I don't, I don't want to rip coaches apart or medical providers, anybody making comments about someone's body image or their weight or their performance solely based off of aesthetics. Why that is one, very, very wrong and dangerous, but two, what is the science behind maybe the psychological toll and, and your guys' experiences with what stories you hear about what triggered maybe somebody who went into a disordered eating situation? So hey, Jason, let's start with that. And while you guys do that, I'm going to pull up some of these articles. So I promise I'm paying attention. <laughs> Sure. I mean, you know, where I end up coming into the mix, you know, because I work in an orthopedic hospital is usually someone's gotten injured. Um, and sometimes it's something, uh, you know, that's maybe a more quote unquote minor, like, uh, you know, a Seavers or a patellar tendonitis or something. And sometimes it's more major or sometimes it's, they've had overtraining and they've seen Dr. Casey and, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, a lot of my experiences with gymnasts is I am then kind of injected into a return to sport situation where I'm trying to understand where this athlete has been, what their existing relationship with food is, and then I'm trying to give them advice, maybe advice they have not heard ever or have even heard that is not the right way. Um, as far as like 
eating more food, eating more carbs, like actually fueling your performance and not cutting. And it's not about more, 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 but it's actually maybe we don't do two a days right after having a joint issue. You know, maybe we actually ramp up how much you're doing over a course of a month or two months, you know, versus just pedal to the metal from day one. Um, and so for me, the big challenge sometimes is understanding where that athlete is what they're open to mm -hmm. and so sometimes if i try to come at them with just a lot of science and knowledge and while it's right it doesn't mean that they're going to take it especially if they've been pushed down this other path very far if you know if you, if you try to push too far the other way they're just going to resist um so i think you try to meet them where they're at you try to get them to understand why and educate them why maybe these new approaches are better. And it's really start with baby steps to have them notice or feel the differences. Um, and I also think a lot of them, they don't always do a good job of self-reflection or self-awareness of how their body feels. They just know push, 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 push until I can't anymore, push until the pain is so bad I can't do anything else versus understanding these warning signals. Cause I kind of tell some of the athletes, especially as they get older is like, you're the quarterback. You've got to be that one sometimes if no one else is looking out for you. And again, it's not because someone is trying to be mean. It's just, you have a lot of involved parties, especially as they get older and you get more elite. There's a lot of people who want to ride on those coattails. And so I really think they, as an athlete need to be self-aware and um, able to take all that information they're taking in and make good sound decisions with it. And I hope I can always provide some positive support in that arena. Yeah. Very well said. And my two cents before Christina goes is, is I've learned this from Josh and as a coach and as a male in the sport, let's be honest, as a male working as a coach in the sport, um, it's just so important to really fuel or to really gear that conversation towards performance. How do you feel fuel for performance? We want to get the most out of our training. Right. And I think, that was a big takeaway for me. Not that I ever think I was really too on the line of saying something that was inappropriate, but I still have checked myself a few times about like, not about a, a, a calorie or a number or, or a, a look thing, but more about a feeling thing and more about like, do you feel fueled? We're feeling for performance. We want gas in the gas tank. So on the positive side of what not do this, not that, <laughs> you know, is uh, try to gear your conversations. If you're a coach in the trenches, quote unquote, and these, these conversations between teenage girls organically happen sometimes about like, Oh, I just feel so heavy or like, Oh, my leotard doesn't fit. Like those things just pop out of thin air. Not that someone's trying to be mean, but it comes up and you have to really make sure you jump on those opportunities and squash those a bit. Like, Hey, like let's kind of cool it with those kind of comments. Right. But also when you line people up and you say, Hey guys, big training week coming up. Um, let's really make sure we talk to our parents. We get our meals, you know, sorted out. We have snacks, we have things to fuel ourselves well, because we want to train and have fun in here. We're going to hit it hard, right? That conversation is so different as opposed to like, Hey guys, tough practice today. People are looking kind of heavy. Maybe we should try to cut back a little bit and try to be thankful about what we're eating. Like those two things, one is positive culture, build us up. One is destroy you. Right. And you might mm -hmm. not think that that's like a, that wasn't a bad thing to say. You know, we just, we need to be leaner. We need, we need to be safe. We need to have more lean body mass. So I'm trying to help them. But if you deliver that message wrong, you're going to have a kid go home and have an <clears> awful <throat> night in their own head. So that's my two cents. But Christina, what do you want to, what do I weigh in here? Yeah, you know, hashtag no body comments. And <laughs> <laughs> this was part of my own story. I, I struggled with an eating disorder around like 14 years old that lasted for, for probably the next eight years. And it stemmed from coaches' comments, parents' comments. Again, you know, they, they didn't mean ill towards me. Um, but that's just how the adolescent, especially female brain, takes it. And as I work with these high level gymnasts today, you know, I, I recently had two conversations with, you know, very well known elite gymnasts that both of them around 13 to 14 years old, when they're starting to go through puberty, their bodies are changing, still incredibly lean and powerful. Their coaches made comments to them about their weight, uh, sometimes in relation to just the aesthetic, right? It's an aesthetic sport. We're, we're drawn to this. And then other comments in relation to, perceived performance de you know deficits of you know you you're looking slow on on floor and bars you could look more fit and, and for both of these elite athletes started the next four to four to four plus years of their lives just at war with food in their body and not fueling properly not hydrating properly um 
when I asked both of them and, and when I work with my clients, I'm like, you know, tell me at, at 13 to 14 years old, how are you doing? How is your body feeling? How is your performance? How are your injuries? Almost all of the time, they're fine. They're like, I was in the best shape of my life. I love gymnastics. Didn't think a whole lot about my body. I wasn't stepping on the scale. I had a pretty healthy relationship with food. And sometimes these comments just really catch them off guard, uh, especially one that I've talked to. You know, she was like, I was so confused. She's like, and I, I even then got taken to a dietitian. And, and this is a hard line to tread. She's like, my parents took me to a dietitian just trying to help. She's like, but it didn't go well because I was just so confused as to why are my parents now cooking me different foods? Why am I being chastised about what I'm eating? Why am I being weighed at the gym? Why am I being asked to bring a food journal into the gym? And so, yeah, I, it's, it's not that anyone necessarily causes an eating disorder or causes these struggles, but it certainly is one spark that will start the wildfire. And you do. I, I think we all have to check ourselves. And uh, even this week, I was talking with a coach that you know had an athlete come back after COVID in the last year. This athlete's probably put on 20 pounds, but she's 15. She's gone through puberty. She started her period. And the coach is just very concerned that she is sluggish. She's not getting the jump she needs. She's had a wrist overuse injury. So the coach doesn't want to exacerbate that. And we just had to have the discussion of, you know, yes, let's work together. Let's dial in her nutrition. Let's see what's going on. But even though her body's bigger than it was when she first went through puberty, this may just be her genetics. She still looks like a little girl. You know, look at collegiate gymnasts like they are young women and so even though she may not have the aesthetic that you personally love as a coach and i understand that this just may be the cards that she was dealt but from your perspective like this isn't my lane but i know as providers you guys can train that appropriately you can have the appropriate strength and conditioning like that is a my modifiable issue in my perspective like if you're complaining that she doesn't have power proper nutrition and proper training should be able to tackle that to some degree versus just saying, gosh, she weighed five or 10 pounds less and she was lighter. That would fix the issue. So yeah, and it's I, hard, right? Yeah, totally. And I, and I want to highlight what you said and then give Josh a second, because I think that what you just said at the end there is a lot of the seed of what people go through as problematic, right? Like if you were just five pounds lighter, you'd have all your skills. If you were just five pounds lighter, you might've not have fallen. That is like the ultimate post ad hoc fallacy of, of gluing a, an outcome to a result. You have no idea if that actually caused what it is. That is you just jumping to a conclusion that you have no idea. What if they slept three hours last night because they were up studying, yep. right? Maybe that's the reason why they're, they're off today and they're not so fast or they're quick twitch, or maybe they're coming off a long training cycle. Maybe they broke up with their boyfriend. Maybe they have a, an issue with their mom. There's so many other reasons why someone's performance could decline. And all of these, a lot of these studies we talk about say that like a lot of people snap trigger and make that comment about like, oh, if you were just five pounds lighter, this wouldn't be an issue or you wouldn't have a back problem or you wouldn't have a knee problem. And like, man, that's the most dangerous thing you can ever have come out of your mouth. So, um, Josh, what do you think? You're someone who has a young daughter who is in gymnastics. So it's very good to hear yeah. your opinion on this matter. Yeah. And I think just real quick on what Christina said, though, that was that was really cool. She I think that she's saying that that the coaches should understand strength and conditioning because that's what they should that's their profession right so yeah. that's what they should understand but i think so many don't understand that and I, i'm kind of beating up on coaches and i don't mean to too much I'll but second after yeah you. <laughs> but i think that if this athlete did gain the weight which is part of us growing up and becoming adults uh that strength and conditioning program now has to change because a, a female is at her uh, power to mass ratio max pre-puberty now she went through puberty. How are we going to fix that that training program to address now that she does have a different power and and mass ratio that's going on? It's your job as a coach to fix that or bring in the professionals that understand that. So so look look to Dave for a for some type of training program that then you can develop and bring in these athletes up to speed. And maybe she doesn't hit her peak at fifteen. Maybe she hits her peak at, at 18 or 19 
And you know what? That's really cool because we thought this through and the athlete understands that we don't have to body shame her because she's a little bit, she's bigger because she's a woman now, you know, it's, she's not a little girl. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, if we can think through that as a profession, as, as, you know, gymnastics is what I'm talking about, that they can make those, those changes in training and and maybe you push your goals out a little bit. And that's why I tell parents all the time is, Hey, just buckle their seatbelts for puberty because, because that's going to be, I just imagine gymnastics is so much physics going on and imagine just mm-hmm. adding an inch to your body and then trying to swing bars. Like I couldn't even imagine yeah. that. Cause I grew, there were some summers where I grew like six inches in a summer. I couldn't even imagine it was hard enough playing basketball, like let alone dismounting off of bars or a beam like that's um, so, so I just think if we look at that as a training, I think that's a big deal. One of the, uh, kind of back to the question, one of the things that, that I just had this past year was a, was a gymnast who was walking with a, um, behind two coaches and they were discussing another gymnast, not this one gymnast that had the issue, but they were, she was walking behind these, these two coaches and she happened to have a knee injury. And these two, these two coaches were talking about a, another athlete that had a knee injury. And they kind of said the same thing, kind of Christina that you were bringing up, you know, if this athlete, this athlete would only lose a little bit of weight. Her knee injury would go away. And this girl who's, who's 13 is looking at this situation. He's like, well, she has a knee injury and I have a knee injury. So if she has to lose weight, that means I have to lose weight too, or else my knee injury won't go away. And so Mm -hmm. she stopped eating carbs, which is because she read it in a magazine that, that, you know, if, if I don't eat carbs then I'll lose weight and I'll be, I'll be the right body size and my knee injury will go away. And so she just kind of got into this whole flow of, of not eating. And she ended up going to a, she's in a different country and went to her, her uh, country's like national meet. And the coaches were like, what the heck's going on? Like this athlete looks incredibly sick. And, but the mom didn't really see it because it was so gradual. The coaches saw it, you know, saw her three months before and three months after. And all of a sudden they had this, this athlete that was in a, in a serious issue and, and they just, they, the mom kind of started picking up some of these things from, from I, one of my talks on relative energy deficiency in sport. And so, so she started seeing all these things going on, like, Hey, we got a problem. We got to fix this, but it can be not only what you say directly to somebody, it can also be just like, kind of, you said, Dave, some offhanded comment, or maybe you're discussing someone else. You just got to be really aware of your surroundings and, and what you're saying. And I'm sure I've said things like that before too, around my family and joking. And, and uh, you know, Dave, I said, that's one thing that dad's getting big trouble for is saying things to their daughters jokingly because, because I'm a, like, I like to joke and have fun. So I make jokes all the time and, and, and have fun at home. But there's some things I got to be really careful of the, that I just watch what I say. Cause that's a, that's a big issue. So I think that one is coaches and, and professionals. We just watch what we say in the environment. You know, that, that might be a conversation that those coaches have in a, in a room somewhere by themselves, but the same thing as, mm-hmm. as dads and even moms, like we got to watch what we're saying, uh, even talking about dieting or changing our diet for our parents and things like that. So that our kids don't get that idea that, that, that that's the way I change my appearance. So if our athletes, and this is, this is kind of the thing that I've always said. If our athletes, especially our female athletes, eat the right food at the right time and they do the right training, their DNA is going to be expressed optimally and they're going to be beautiful. And it might be different than what my daughter looks like. You know, your daughter might look different than mine. And that's okay. It's just a way that we're all different and we're all special. My daughter's going to be tall and, and, and a little lanky as she gets older. But, but, um, you know, she's going to look different than Simone Biles. They're both beautiful girls because they're doing the right training and eating the right foods and doing the right stuff. And so that's the, that's just something that we got to think about too, as, as parents and professionals. Yeah, absolutely. And there's two things I want to kind of mention here. And then I want to highlight a couple of comments from the research study that are really important. So one is that on Christina's comment about the no comment, I think that most people intuitively know not to make a comment negatively about somebody gaining weight or having an image issue. But I, I saw this post from a very prominent gymnast in the world. We're just going to say that because I don't want to uh, isolate somebody. But she said how important it is to not compliment someone's weight loss. If somebody loses a bunch yep. of weight or is really lean, 
you can't make a comment about that. And in our society, we oftentimes want to jump to making somebody feel good for their hard work. And it's not malicious. Like, wow, good job. You're working so hard. You look so lean. You look so good job on your butt. But what you're implying is that before they lost the weight, they weren't enough, right? Or they mm -hmm. weren't fit enough or they weren't performing well. And so the no comment thing is just don't say it, right? Just don't say it either way. What you should say is like, I'm glad you're happy. I'm, ha I'm happy you're feeling mm -hmm. well. Like those kind of comments either way can be spun into a negative because it can, it can get pulled the wrong way. And, um, on top of that, a very common coaching practice, parent practice, self athlete practice, because they read it in a magazine. I'm not pinning somebody is, Oh, I'm a little heavy from whatever. I'll just do more cardio before practice. I'll just knock out an hour, an hour of elliptical or biking before practice, right? That couldn't be the worst advice ever, right? Because what you're doing from the scientific practice process is you're depleting your glycogen stores, you're pulling all of the pre-fuel tank out, and now you're going to go do a four-hour training practice. That's super hard, right? That couldn't be worse advice if you're giving out somebody. And I can't tell you how many side talks I've heard walking through meetings and stuff like, oh, she's just knocking out an hour of cardio before practice three days a week and it shredded the right, weight right off her. She's lean machine now. And I'm like, she's going to die. She's literally going to die. And in my old self, I was too scared. I should have been like, uh, hello, sir. Um, you suck. Can you please not say that again? Right. <laughs> I think those are the kind of things that you have to call those actions out, not in a, such an aggressive way, but like pull that person aside and be like, Hey man, listen, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but like, that's not a great idea because you're actually going to really put them at risk. And so that's something that I see uh, quite a bit as an issue is someone should think about. And there's, there's we'll, we'll spin this question positively now. So what, what does somebody do? Because I'm a coach and I empathize with Josh. I think, or I empathize with coaches from what Josh said. Sometimes well-intentioned coaches just want to do the right thing with strength conditioning. And they got horrible education because there's no on-ramp program to become a coach. They were just like, yeah, you can coach, give it a whirl, take your safety cert. There's no formal strength conditioning. And we've belabored this point on other podcasts, but they don't have the right tools in their arsenal to do a good strength conditioning program and understand anaerobic systems versus aerobic and glycogen and stuff like that. So they're like in the, in the dark trying to figure out how do I help these athletes get new skills? And they feel like they don't have the right tools. And so should somebody have an issue where maybe their kids are going through a natural puberty spur and they're just super slow or the coach is legitimately just concerned for their well-being about like, I'm worried about them getting hurt because they've gone, they've took a six month break and they came back and they're, they do have maybe 15 more pounds that are, are not optimal lean body mass. The coach in that situation or the parent in that situation or their friends in that situation are like, I want to help, but I don't want to say something wrong. So I'll just not say anything and I'll just let it go. So what do you guys recommend that coaches, parents, or athletes do in that situation to not make it a negative thing, but to actually have a positive, uh, we care about you moving forward. We want to help you with your goals. So Jay, you want to start with that? Sure. Um, so I think it's a really good question. I think it's a tough question because you have things people want to say and have of concern, um, but they don't want to say the wrong thing. I think the first best thing you can do is first just – Ask the athlete, how are you feeling? You know, like talk to the person who's actually living it mm -hmm. and get a sense of what their perspective is. So, you know, do they what think a it's a concept, problem? right? I know, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, sorry, and yeah. and so and it's funny because sometimes in the middle, like and when I get consoles, I'll ask them, like, how can I help you? And then they they're like, because they've never been asked like their thought about it before. And so um, I think that alone, asking open-ended questions, getting a, a sense mm -hmm. of what their, that athlete is feeling can definitely open doors. Um, I think having conversations and being open and honest saying, I don't have all the answers. You can certainly tell me if you feel like I am off track here. I mean, even as a quote unquote expert, you know, I will say that to athletes. I'm saying, you know, like I might know about nutrition and exercise science, but you are the expert in your own life and your own body. So, you know, I tell them you're the expert, you know, in your own, own body. And so I really want to like marry those two. Like I want to give you ideas and thoughts, but I also want your feedback on whether you think that idea is a good idea for you. Um, and and feel free to call me out. So I think one thing I really try to do is try to create that rapport and that comfort level where they can feel like they can push back on me, even though I might be in this quote unquote position of authority, because then I feel like they trust me and can actually be open when it 
does get more serious uh, where they feel they do need to turn to someone and say, hey, this is going on. Um, and then I can feel I can be there for them. So I really feel like those are some kind of simple, easy ways where you can just start that dialogue, open-ended questions, saying you're kind of trying to get feedback and, and that you can tell me that, I, that I'm wrong. And, and it can really open a lot of doors. Yeah, super well said. Christina, you want to pitch in there? And then Josh? Yeah, yeah. This is, you know, something I pretty recently, like just a lot of different sports dietitians and I have been discussing, um, you know, how do you navigate these conversations about weight and nutrition with your athletes without causing an issue? And obviously with everything that has come forward now, a lot of us are like, oh my gosh, I can't say anything. I don't want to cause an issue. But you know, in the trenches, I, I think you just have to to make the judgment calls based on the athlete. So, you know, when I get an elite gymnast that is 17 years old and was told at 13 she needed to lose weight, she's very aware of her body and her weight. She's weighing herself. It may not be disordered, but that awareness is there. And so, you know, if mom comes to me wanting to help her daughter and mom tells me, Hey, you know, coach thinks she's gained some weight, thinks she could be faster on floor and bars. Looks like she's got some cellulite at the onset. I don't know what the daughter knows. I just know what the mom has told me. And that can be very damaging right there. Um, so when I get on the phone with both of them the first time to talk about working together, I'm always very careful because I don't know what the gymnast knows, but then if they're older and I'm seeing them alone, that's where they're able to kind of open up. And I just, you know, just like you said, Jason, open-ended questions, you know, all the empathy in the world to just allow them to give you their lived experience and they're going to direct you to, to what they need. And that conversation is very different than the 14, 15 year old just gone through puberty now is 15 or 20 pounds heavier. The coach has concerns at that point, you know, I think it's appropriate for the coach to talk to the mom or the dad and voice their concerns. But then I feel like that conversation needs to go to a professional. And I have a situation like that right now where I had a conversation with the mom, not in front of the gymnast of what are you seeing? Kind of what's going on? What are you guys doing? I then have a separate conversation with the coach of, you know, what are you seeing? What are your concerns? How are, how is her gymnastics? And really trying to navigate is this her weight? Is this the fact that she just came off COVID and she's grown a ton? Like, are there different things that, you know, maybe your little 12 year old gymnast don't need, but this 14, 15 year old young woman may need a different training program or whatever she needs to get her back up to the speed. Certainly we'll evaluate nutrition, but when we work with that athlete, it's going to hundred percent come from a performance nutrition standard. And this one athlete in particular, she would, she voiced, I feel sluggish. She's not been introduced that we know of to the I'm fat, which I think that's the other key. I tell parents and coaches all the time, you have no idea what your gymnasts are watching, what they're looking at, what they're talking about with their teammates. I can't tell you the messages that I get on Instagram from young high level gymnasts that their parents are clueless. And, and dang, sadly, sometimes that, that dang TikTok. Yeah, yeah. I tell parents, I'm like, you need to know every single thing that your gymnast is looking at. That email account that they have from iCloud on their Apple product that you have no idea about. Um, you got you got to follow these things because a lot of them are screaming for help. They're already trying crazy things. So yeah, I I just, I think it's a really touchy subject. I think a lot of education needs to go out for all of us of of really how do you appropriately navigate these things while trying your very best to protect the athlete, um, to give them a voice, but also not to create problems that aren't there right now. So. Super well said. Josh? Yeah, I like that. And, and. I think too, just starting off as they're as kids are young and they're kind of growing into some of these things and making helping the gyms create these habits that aren't that so that they 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 learn these just basic principles of 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 we eat for performance and we we take food in our body for performance and for fun so and then mm-hmm. and then we enjoy ourselves but but it's not a you know there's going to be times when when things happen and, and kind of, I mean, you guys have, 
had the horror stories too, but I've had hundreds of parents come up to me and be like, Hey, my, my eight year old or 10 year old or 12 year old daughter is, has gained like, like, look at her. Like she's completely different now. She's gained a ton of weight. Uh, and I'm always like, Hey, just, just be patient. Like she's probably getting ready to hit a big growth spurt. Like their body's just storing up some energy. She's about ready to shoot up six inches. And then like six months I see him again and they're like, Oh, look, she's six inches taller. And so, <laughs> so, and, and, you know, she doesn't, she didn't have a weight problem. She had a normal human condition problem of, of growing as a <laughs> child. And some people just grow different than, than, you know, something, somebody else. So, um, yeah. And, and just kind of on that, I just love, I love it when kids are able to, to just look at what they're putting in their body as a, as a, um, and, and be able to tell, Hey, when I take in half of a peanut butter and banana sandwich on Dave's killer bed as my pre-workout snack, like I feel so good and I'm able to make it like most of the practice and I, I have tons of energy and I love them being able to relate to their food, to the, to, to how they feel rather than, than thinking these things. But what you're saying, Christina, on the, um, I was kind of coming around to this because uh, one of the things that I always tell parents is we are competing against billions and billions and billions of dollars of advertising. So we cannot, as parents, we have to figure out our message because we're competing against McDonald's and we're competing against the magazines and we're competing against the, the, and we've all seen like the crazy Instagram models that are doing stupid stuff during all the protests. No different. Like, like they're just, they're, they're faking all of these photos to, to make themselves mm -hmm. look a certain way so that our kids feel guilty and go and buy products. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I, that's one of the things that's always driving me nuts. And I, and I tell, I tell the parents, I tell parents, Hey, this is something that we really got to watch is, is, is just watch the, the amount of money that's being spent against you and just come up with your mm -hmm. message and stick with your message and help your children understand that it's not the, it's not, that's not the way that, that the body works. So that's just mm -hmm. kind of my couple thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's two really important things here. One is I want to sing Josh's praises because this was a, this exact situation happened to us. Whereas we, as a gym had put in five years of work and we're like, mm, we're missing something. Like the kids are real tired. We're a little nervous that some of these kids are, are maybe not in, in, in the shape they need to be safe doing gymnastics. And so I was like, okay, I'm not the guy. No way. Right. And I have female counterpart coaches who were like, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not doing it. So we're like, what do we do? I'm like, well, let's have Josh come and talk to these kids about everything, recovery, sleep, nutrition, hydration, because I know that mm -hmm. stuff really well, but I'm their coach. I'm, they're not going mm -hmm. to hear from me. Right. So Josh came up and the best thing Josh did was he was like, okay, five to six 30. We're going to talk to the parents separately in a separate room, six 30 to seven. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to the kids seven to eight. We're going to talk to the coaches and then we're going to all have a discussion together at the end. And it was really good because the message could get like, what's your job in this situation? What's your job in this mm -hmm. situation? What's your job in this situation? And our, culture of how the entire gym flipped around how we even approach recovery nutrition and food was significantly changed by that um by that actual you know conversation because everybody had their own hat on for what they should do and i think something that's really important too and that jason said that i want to make sure we, we highlight really well is that you have to remember that a lot of the research behind behavior change is is long lasting change comes from painting their ideal vision of themselves in the future performance wise and mapping out how certain steps are going to help them get there. And this happens all the time on the on the training side, right? I want to do this skill. I want to get to this level. I want to get to this college goal, right? And you're, okay, you're saying your goal is here. Well, here's why these really hard strength and conditioning days and you being here for attendance every day and you not talking when your turn is up. That's why I'm frustrated because your actions are not mapping to your goal. Right. And so you can flip that on its side and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, someone, but like, if you want to be like, like, I feel sluggish, I want to do a full routine. Well, your job is to be like, okay, well, we need to help you with better recovery strategies to optimize your fuel. So you can get through a full floor routine. And maybe in the back of your mind as a nutritionist and correct me if I'm wrong, you may tackle some of that lean body mass or body recomposition, but in their head, performance mm -hmm. gin floor routine. And in your mind, you're like, okay, we're just going to pivot a little bit here and give them baby steps to feel better about the way they look, feel, perform whatever it is. So yeah. Any concluding thoughts on that? Because then I want to jump to weight and measurements and stuff like that and, and highlight my favorite part from one of these articles. So anybody else want to pick? Yeah. If they feel really good and they're feeling like their performance is, is where it needs to be, they're going to have more fun in gym, which is going to help them work harder. And mm -hmm. they're going to have, they're going to be, they're going to be more in tune with their body and, and not in the, in the disordered eating way. 
but in the, you know, they just feel really good and they're moving really good, which is going to help them just be better and, and have their, their, their body's going to change along with that thing. They're going to express their DNA better. So, yep. um, yeah. Well said. Anybody else? I wanted, yeah. I want to highlight two things really fast. First, I love that approach Josh took with the individual groups because I'm sure we've all seen it that you get a coach with an athlete together or with a parent and you ask an athlete how they feel and what they say is not the truth because they know that the adult next to them is hearing that. And so that is a huge factor. And I love that approach you took with, with the, uh, with that group splitting them up. The second thing is it really comes down to gymnastics right now is dealing with, you're trying to create an elite athlete around a very chaotic time in a kid's life from a growth and development standpoint. Like this is just where it is. You can, we can start making the arguments that like maybe waiting until post puberty is a time to develop the best, strongest athlete like they do in most other sports, like it, how it used to be. Um, but I think all coaches I think should or if you're going to work with this group, you know, myself included, I think should take some level of coursework in pediatric biology and development and mental development, because I think that is a common thread. If you're in this sport, you should be aware of and should appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are not just little adults, which is how we try to treat them from every aspect, right? Nutrition, training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the whole adult gymnastics thing. I think that's a, yeah, awesome. I've been, I've been talking about that for forever. I can't wait until the entire Olympic team is out of college. Like the so, men? Like the men. Yep. And then we have Simone Biles doing another, you know, not only does she win this next one, if it ever happens, but she also wins the next one and possibly the next one because, because you can do gymnastics as an adult if you train correct. I know many mm -hmm. very, very good 25, 26, 27, 28 elite gymnasts right now. A lot. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. Yeah. Super good. Well, we definitely bashed that point to death, but this is good. Yeah. We want to get into this. I like these long forms. So I want to share, um, this is from an article that Christina sent. This is the nutritional recommendations and guidelines for women in gymnastics, current aspects of critical interventions. The, my favorite, absolute favorite, and this is going to get into the conversation about why Honestly, not even daily weigh-ins because I think that practice is starting to move away. But I think just weight and number and looking at a, a, a scale is a terrible idea to measure how this is happening. Right. But let me share this real quick because I think that this is this really speaks to a huge issue that we have. So this was in a study they did elsewhere, but it says uh, Dallas in 2016 reported a large energy deficit in female athletes. This is gymnasts with their average in, uh, energy intake not adequately meeting quantitatively or qualitatively the nutritional recommendations of the corresponding six hour training. So non geeks like us, what's that saying is that the people that were studied in this large study essentially were always under a caloric intake. They always had a, a negative energy balance and a deficit, right? So in the, in the thought process of be lean, be thin, try to be more lean body mass, whatever it is. And it, the most interesting part here is they go on to say, um, essentially they didn't have the energy for training, but, and I want to highlight this, um, this was confirmed whereas associated with higher body, uh, the deficits were associated with higher percentages of body fat over prolonged times. So think about that critically for non-nutrition people is essentially the deficit being there for so long and chronically stressing the body in terms of deficit was increasing the body fat percentage, right? So in, in the real world, what that means is that say you have a situation where you're telling an athlete, Hey, got to lean out, got to be thin, got to be thin. And they are like ripping the calorie deficit down too far. Their body's going into survival mode and they're saying store fat. I'm, I'm, I need energy. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm getting traumatized from how much training I'm doing and the lack of energy I have to fuel it. And I think the important thing to say here is, uh, the most likely is explanations in geek time. So blackout, if you don't want to hear nerd stuff, but the most likely explanation for this phenomenon occurs, um, various homeostatic mechanisms, the reduction in metabolic rate, the adjustable thermogenesis, survival mechanism of energy storage, and increased muscle cat uh, catabolic state. Various metabolic and hormonal changes, such as estrogen, T3, IGF-1, leptin, and uh, increased cortisol with endocrine resistance, as well as general disruption of the homeostasis of adipose tissue. So, and what this is saying, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because this is my interpretation from studying stress neuroendocrinology, is that we are 
overstressing the body and tapping into survival mechanisms because of such ridiculous, awful advice about energy deficit and pulling back on training that the body is revolting and trying to stay safe by doing the opposite of what people are saying. So this is a problem because if you're a coach, a medical provider, a parent, another person, the gymnast themselves, and you're saying like, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. And then the body starts recoiling and going above an average. And then you come back and say, you're not working hard enough. You're clearly not doing it because your, your body weight's not changing, blah, blah, blah. You are literally causing a negative spiral into just a terrible situation because of the science and physiology of how this works. So that hey, Dave, was, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, just, please. Uh, just a quick thought on what you're saying. Uh, I almost think, and, and maybe y'all can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I almost think, especially an adolescent and a younger adolescent athlete, I think that they don't, it almost be impossible for them to actually intake enough, enough food into their body in order to, to train for six hours a day. I, and it's kind of been one of my, my things that I've had for, uh, for, you know, a lot of the training and, and some of the stuff that you just said is, is they can't take in enough food. They don't have the ability to do it as a kid to take in that much food. And they're not meant to, a kid is not meant to work out for six hours a day. And these are elite athletes. So it's not necessarily, the argument doesn't work. Oh, they go and they stand around a lot. Like I've seen, a, I've seen elite athletes work out. Like I think it's difficult for an elite athlete at, at a younger age to even intake enough calories in order to fuel what they need to do. So I think some of this is just based on the sport. What I was saying at the beginning is that the training has to change because the the output is way too much for any kid to be able to input enough food. And I don't know, maybe y'all have, have a different thought on it, but that's kind of my thought when I first read that. Yeah. I'll just say one thing on the coaching side, then I want to hear from Jace Christina, but I know amazing coaches, shout out Nick Ruddick, who is just a legend right here, right? He is, he knows it's better to go in and do super efficient planned out very methodical training for two and a half hours with a good warm up after and do something different than stand around for five hours and just look at each other and like, bah, ta -di -da, or like, oh, let's do some more, like plan your training, go and knock out your three hours, right? And then go home <laughs> and then come back again. Goodness knows you're probably training six days a week. So you have 24 more hours and you're probably gonna be back in the gym to try it again. So that's my two cents, but let's go Jason first. And Christina, I definitely want to hear from you. Sure. So, I mean, I think these are all really good points. Um, I think being in the gym for six hours a day, I think is a double whammy, right? So I think to your point, Dave, if you can do a six hour session in two and a half hours and be more efficient, that gives you three and a half more hours to focus on recovery, to focus on mm -hmm. getting in the food, to focus on getting your sleep, to focus on all these other things, you know, you're in school to do your homework, to just like be a kid, to go hang out with your friends. Um, and then, on top of it, yeah, I think when you're in the when you're in the gym for six hours and you have chalk on your hands, it's not really easy to just go run and grab a snack, you know. And I've tried to do that. I've tried to work with many athletes in kind of gyms whose cultures are not really open to saying, "I'm going to go take a break. I'm going to go get a snack, you know, in the <laughs> fridge, and I'll come back in like 15 minutes." Um, yeah. And so I think that piece of it makes it even harder to get the fuel you need in. So I think if you say from a purely, is it possible to get that amount of calories in? Yes. Is it like likely in most instances that they will be able to? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Christina, what are your thoughts on that? Especially with if somebody could hit on um, why you could have such a fluctuation in poundage on a scale that it's so inaccurate to go based on like whether that's actually changing, right? My, literally, I'll go for a run and my weight will change three and a half pounds. I could just sweat a ton. So that's my two cents. But what are your thoughts, Christina? Weight on weight flux. All of it. Talk about yeah. that? Whether it's the, All of it. Maybe, well, the chronic energy deficit causing not a good idea or the energy flux and stuff like that, whatever you want to tackle. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think chasing a number on the scale, it, it's just for young athletes, it's just a disaster, right? Like the number's down. So you're good. So then you loosen up or maybe give yourself permission to eat and then the numbers back up for whatever reason. And now you're bad, you're fat, you don't eat, you do extra cardio. Um, a lot of my story, right? As a young gymnast with an eating disorder, I mean, I was like super injured, horrible Achilles tendonitis, had been in rehab for like eight months, not getting better. And I would go to the gym, well, I would swim at school because I had athletic leave. So I would swim 
Then I'd come to the gym, I'd get on the bike, and then obviously couldn't tumble, couldn't vault, but like conditioned, you know, for literally the four plus hour practice, all out of just fear and and being chained to the scale. And it wasn't until, you know, years later, someone explained to me body weight versus body composition and all the myriad of factors that go into why we see fluctuations in the scale. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't love the scale. I, I do think weighing once a week is problematic because if you weigh every Friday and this Thursday you had, you know, salty Chinese food, your weight is going to be skewed tomorrow come as compared to last week. Uh, obviously you could take a running average of those four data points in a month. Um, I learned, I've learned a lot over the years from, you know, some of the, the best experts in the bodybuilding world, like Eric Helms and Alan Aragon. Yep. And, you know, obviously aesthetic performance, aesthetic is different than performance sports. But I do say that in the bodybuilding world, they're getting a lot of things right in the last couple of years. And regarding body weight, you know, Lyle McDonald is another expert that writes on this a lot. You know, he, he advocates for daily weighing, taking the average and comparing week to week. And even for the female, it's maybe we just compare the week after your menstrual cycle when that is really your driest weight of the month when we're actually going for body comp changes if we don't have more sophisticated methods. Now, obviously, I'm not going to advocate a young gymnast is weighing themselves every day because it's just very difficult for them to not get emotional about the number. You know, even if in your head, you're like, oh, it does flux. And I'm looking at the averages, like it, it still can be very distracting and have some pretty like severe psychological ramifications. Like I think there's a lot of gymnasts who walk in the gym, maybe they're a half a pound up from yesterday, but in their heads, I'm fat, I'm slow. I, like it's this self-fulfilling prophecy that now coaches are having to deal with that aspect of, if you didn't know what you weighed, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think anything different. But, you know, gymnasts are so attuned and just hyper aware about their bodies. You know, we do feel every little, you know, oh, I, like last night I had like beef bulgogi. And so, of course, I noticed today that my rings are tighter and I felt kind of puffy. But like, I didn't quote get fat. I, it didn't affect my workout. But that's a 20 something year old being able to kind of rationalize that versus the 16 year old who someone's weighing them, they're weighing their, themselves. And so, yeah. It's, it, it's just, it's not something I'm going to advocate. Thankfully, a lot of gyms are taking the scales out. I will say that a pretty prominent gym just recently took their scale out because some of the younger coaches have finally like stepped up and said, this is wrong. Um, it's just so wrong, right? You, you have a 16 year old elite gymnast coming in the gym. She hasn't had anything to eat or anything to drink because when she steps on that scale, she wants it to be lower than yesterday. Yep. She steps on it in the middle of the practice, hoping it goes down. She steps on it at the end of practice, hoping it goes down and then swears to herself, I will not see a higher number than what I just saw after practice, even though she's horrifically dehydrated and under fueled. But in her mind, I just lost two pounds and I have to keep progressing towards this goal. And it's a disaster. But unfortunately, that's whether it's a scale at the gym or a scale at home. That's the, I would say, you know, we've all seen it. Like that's the pretty standard trajectory uh, in a lot of cases, not always, not yeah. always. Yeah. Um, but sometimes but that's yeah. happening in a, in a, in a private setting behind closed doors when the gymnast or the coach is not doing anything malicious. There's no scale in the oh, gym. Yeah. The gymnast has gotten pushed on subconsciously from the culture of our sports so much that at home before practice, they weigh yep. themselves, they run home and they weigh themselves before they go to bed. Right. That kind of stuff still yep. happens. Oh, 100%, yeah. Coaches are not all at fault here yep. for sure. Josh, what's up? Yeah, I was just gonna say on our on the study that you read, one of the one of the most interesting thing was the reduction in metabolic rate for yeah. the for the athletes that are doing this overtraining. And it's very, you know, I work with with uh, Rangers and uh, guys that have graduated from from Ranger school. This is one of the biggest things that we see with them, and one of the reasons why they have issues with weight for for years and years after this, and why they struggle with weight going forward is because when they go to ranger school 62 days they're at about 
they're and studies differ on how much caloric deficit they have, but they're in the thousand, thousand at least thousand caloric deficit each day. And so they can they can decrease in their basal metabolic rate by by two to five hundred calories per day. And so so they come out and they're eating the same amount of food. Same thing a gymnast go back to this training thing that I keep bashing, but but a gymnast may may have this reduction in in metabolic rate and continue eating the same amount of food. And then it can also have the same effect as same thing with my Rangers. It's really funny how, how soldiers and gymnasts, like the training, like the, <laughs> the messed up parts are all the messed up parts of both. Like they're so similar. It's yeah, almost, a 30 year old man who's chosen to do it. Yeah, it is true. It is true. Um, but, but like the way that they, the way that the, the issues with the training are very similar yeah. and, uh, together. But yeah, just like looking at things out. Or 30 year old woman. I just realized I said that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a great hook. How is a 14 year old gymnast like a 30 year old like or like army ranger? Yeah. Find that over here. <laughs> well, all the ones that all the ones that I work with are are uh, lieutenants. So they've just gotten out of most of them are twenty two. So they're coming out and they're twenty two. And it's actually like it's almost scarily similar how they want to overtrain and just like Dave's saying like a lot of it's the the athlete and they're athletes just like any other athletes and they're mm -hmm. professional athletes and so so they just get the they get the thought in their head hey if I don't if I don't do squats today uh I'm gonna be I'm not gonna be strong enough to continue same thing if I don't do 20 reps on on bars I'm not gonna have this routine down even though I've done it 16 million times like the, the 20 times today has to happen yeah. so they're very similar in their in their thought process and again it gets back to athletes are athletes these are the same problems that other athletes have with overtraining and and not doing it i just think we are doing this i uh, you guys have already brought this up a couple times they're to they're to kids and they don't have the mental capacity to to make some of these choices yeah. so it's our job as adults to pull them back yeah yeah I wanna, okay i just want to hop in and talk about one use of weight that I think from a biological perspective can be helpful. When I get these young athletes, what I do with their weight and their height is I go to the pediatric growth charts mm. yeah. and I try to actually get a yeah. look at their history. Sometimes it's hard to get the history, but if I can get some historical weights, I want to know every year, are they growing and staying in the same general percentile range? So if I see a kid in one year living somewhere around the 60th percentile and the next year they're down in the 20th and they didn't grow any height, or they grew just like an inch. And and so for me, like that's a great way to use weight to be like, okay, like this is your body. Something's mm -hmm. happening to it. What can we do to help you be better, feel better, get stronger? So to me, like that is one area where it actually can be helpful for me, especially if I am able to see trends. Yeah. Again, and remember, Jason is a registered dietitian for everyone that's listening. They're not a coach, not a medical, you know, not a uh, medical non-dietitian. So yeah, all super good points. And I think we're, we're doing really good and rolling through these. The thing that I want to add in, in my world, what I love, what I study really, really significantly is like stress endocrinology and the balance of, you know, ramp up, ramp down more from a strength conditioning performance point of view. And I really want to highlight some great studies from like Robert Sapolsky and other people who talk about, you know, you have two sides of our, of our system. We have our ramp up sympathetic and our pull down parasympathetic. And there's an entire set of epigenetic factors that turn on or off based on what you're eating, right? When you're sleeping, but also your stress levels on and off, right? We're, we're built and evolved for the don't get eaten by a lion, turn it on, run away pull back down. And so when you look at the literature on histone modifications, some things that come out with these chronic elevations in, in a sympathetic drive or an adrenal burnout, it's interesting because as you have sympathetic drive, obviously that's not a time to recover your tissue and build new bones and absorb your nutrients and get your fuel in. That's a time to pour all your glycogen into your bloodstream and out of your muscles and run from this tiger. So in the real human world, what we're dealing with is when you're doing ramp up to a training because of the mental anticipatory stimulus of the training coming. It's probably an hour or so, right? But you also have that three to four or five hours that you're training. And then you have that post when you're coming down. Humans are the only people that can think themselves into a stress response. That's why they talk about such these, it's called auto noetic consciousness. Some people can think about their rent and get nervous or think about a competition coming up and get nervous. So they can recruit a stress response just by doing that. So if you're constantly either physically strain, like straining yourself with training load, or you're in a chronic, chronic deficit, which is a threat to your system, your body's getting a negative threat, or you're so emotionally destroyed by the comments people make on social media or your coaches make or your parents make or you make to yourself, not even putting them on the table maybe, you're constantly in this flight 
response, right? And there's no time you could be eating great and you could be eating well, but there's no absorption and there's no turnover of bone remodeling. There's no mechanotransductive properties that are going to get put into positive growth because you're never resting. You're never recovering. And that's where I got into this stuff with nutrition and why I started talking to so many people is because I see so many athletes that are literally chronic low level stress, just fluttering all the time. There's never a pull down. And so they never actually absorb. They never actually get stuff in their body. They never have time between training loads to recover and actually grow new tissue. So there's no adaptation. There's no skill progress. There's no better scores. There's no the injuries never heal. Right. And this is why it all gets wrapped into culture because those things really kind of go a long way. So that's my small nerd topic on this, but anything else on the weight topic before we talk about the next one or scales, I should say in general. Cool. Um, I think we kind of beat to death the positive too. talk about performance, talk about right. The other side of the coin. Is there anything else positively that people want to add about? Like, I think strength conditioning performance tests are sometimes better. How do you feel? And are you performing like you want to? I think those are the best metrics to use for someone if their recovery nutrition is on point. So those are my two cents, but anybody else are we good there? I, I'll just say one thing kind of relation to just like weight and body shape. So I talk a lot about, you know, body diversity, you know, mm -hmm. let, let's look at the spectrum of, you know, Jordan Weber, Nasty Luke and Sean Johnson, Simone Biles, like these are all world-class gymnasts that have completely different bodies from each other. And I'll say so many parents and gymnasts are like, oh my gosh, thank you. Like, thank you for saying that. Like, my daughter, you know, she's got bigger thighs, she's got whatever, she's always self conscious. And like, you've given her permission to like live in her body. Mm -hmm. And I talk a lot about, you know, growth charts, and what your mom and dad gave you. And, you know, your fat patterns are a product of your genetics and estrogen and puberty, like you don't get to choose if cellulite shows up on your thighs at 16 or not. Like, that's not because of what you ate. Like that's just your, your genetics, you know, in, in most cases when the athlete is still, you know, pretty lean. And so, yeah, I, I think verbalizing that and not to be too woo here, but I, I mean, certainly the nutrition well realm right now, we've got, you know, health at every size and intuitive eating as just two huge movements to take the focus off that thin ideal and, you know, rigid dieting with all the data that we have on, you know, weight regain, post dieting, whatever. Um, and I think that fits within gymnastics. Like, yes, it's still a sport. It's a high level sport. There may be situations where an athlete is carrying excess body fat, whatever, but on the same token, like this athlete didn't get to choose their body, but there is no one gymnastics body type especially I think with the code as it is now, I mean, it's a code of power and strength. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we're out of the eighties and nineties and, you know, there's that point of diminishing returns where, yeah, if you were five pounds lighter, maybe you would, you know, fly higher, but at the same time, what's it going to cost you to lose those five pounds? And are we going to get injured in the process or an eating disorder or just, we're not recovering. We're, whatever. So yep. yes, you led the next question perfectly. So props on you. Yes. Good. <laughs> good. So the next one we want to tackle, which I think is a very, very permeated thought process from the eighties and the nineties, which is athlete A did an amazing job of highlighting. This is like the myth slash wrong scientific support behind the super thin, super lean, um, aesthetic is the only way to perform well in gymnastics. And so let's first talk about maybe what the science is behind why that's not true related to the anaerobic nature of our sport. But then also if somebody wants to tackle or dive into maybe like, like you said, with the code, like lean body mass and power and stuff like that. I, th I think that that's still, man, that still is so present in our culture, even though we're not talking about it and it's not like directly the cultural undertone is we should always be these tiny little sticks that are easier to spot when they're younger and that they're easier to perform these crazy skills. And then we have people doing triple doubles and they're like, yeah, you should try to learn, you should try to learn double pipes yeah. when you're 12 and you have literally no quads or hamstrings or glutes to work with. And it's like, okay, we're going to land on bones. Is that what we're going for here? So yeah. Who wants to maybe start on the, the science behind why that's a terrible idea? So, I mean, I think from the simplest perspective is it's a power to weight ratio. Why are we only focusing on the weight? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I think, again, it comes down to biology. Like, when you hit puberty, yes, you may get more weight, but then you also get the capacity to for better 
power and strength development, more muscular development. And, and so I think this idea of body composition, not just body weight is one factor, but even regardless of that, that's why I think performance measures are so important in understanding that sometimes like, yes, like going through, and I'm just kind of shifting a little bit, but like going through puberty within any sport is like a year, six to months to a year of like, what the hell happened to me? <laughs> like, yep. and, and so I think what you can do is, is getting people to understand, like you're going through this process, you're going through a tunnel. Let's not try to go, don't try to get yourself out of the tunnel, you're in it. But let's try to make yourself as great as you can be so when you come out of it the other side, you are the best train coming down that track so you can hit it hard and hit it well yeah. and be the best you can be. Um, so for me, I think that's really – if you take it from that perspective and you educate everyone, including the athlete, on this biological process, then I think in a lot of ways it makes weight a non-factor because they understand the role of it and the role of the ratio. And then they can focus on things that they actually can have influence on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Super well said. And I think that goes back to Jason to the to what we have to our our whole thing that we're talking about as parents and coaches, and we're all on the same we're all on the same wavelength. We're all on the same topics, and we're and we're sticking to that message because it's the anti message to 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 the the media and everything else that's out there. So I think that if we can stick to that message, and my thing has been always too one of the. I don't think that we focus enough on control prior to going through puberty. And then all of a sudden we start going through puberty and we're like, Oh, we got all these injuries. Well, that's because we never focused because it was so easy for our athletes to do gymnastics when they were at this great, you know, weight to power ratio. And then now they're struggling to get through because they never worked on that control or that. And Dave's taught me a ton about, about core and just the ability to, to, to control oneself. And then, and then just developing that control as an athlete and not so much about being strong, but about being in control and then developing the strength. So I think that, that that's something too that we got to look at is, is instead of pushing for all these huge skills when you're at this great ratio, hey, let's think about how are we going to get these athletes through this, this next phase of their life. And that's going to come down to them being able to control themselves and, and keep their bodies under control being able to, to diaphragmatically breathe and being able to, to move and, and, and land properly, that's all going to get tested like to such a high level once they start puberty. And so if they can, if they can learn to develop those things prior and then they move through it, it's going to be such a better thing for the athlete. Yeah. But that requires a culture that is willing to say puberty is not the end of your sport. <laughs> it's not the end of your career because it creates this hard line that is totally irrational and not backed by science, but it becomes this thing. So then they just try to delay puberty. So like actually missing your primary menarche is actually like a good thing, which is mm -hmm. crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, that was my one little addition to that. Oh, Sorry, I'm now. very glad you said that. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. That's by far one of the, and I'll just weigh this in before uh, Christina goes, talks more, but like, that's something I see all the time is like the, we need to get all their skills in before they go through puberty, because they're going to magically just not know how to do gymnastics anymore. It's like, God, that's such garbage. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Maybe you can like spot them a little bit easier, but like maybe if they were stronger and had more connective tissue and had full growth plates matured, they could actually tolerate these things a little bit easier. Right. And so I completely agree. There's so many people that I know of friends of mine that were elites or Olympians or just anecdotally seeing things that they got, they were like overtrained and undernourished so much that their body just was survival mode. And then they got a small injury. We're out three, three, three to six months. And they're like, Oh, they gained so much weight. Like, no, they grew like a normal human because they've been in red S syndrome for the last six months or six years. Right. Like that's, what's going on. You have a lot of gymnasts who are like, hey, like, I took some time or like, I just like, boom, went through puberty all of a sudden. It's because it was delayed for so long. And they get on the other side of that and they have coaches that care about them. And they're like, I'm the best gymnast I've ever been in my life when I'm 18, 19, 20, 21, 26, 28, 29. Right. So like, that's the, the, the brutal honesty is like, that's what's happening to a lot of kids is they're overtrained, undernourished. They have red S undiagnosed and they just don't grow normally. And then they grow and they're like, oh, this is such a bummer. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, Dave, can I explain real quick what kind of, at least in my head, what red S is? Cause some yeah. people may not know we're kind of throwing oh, that out. Yeah. I didn't really, I didn't really explain it very well the first time I threw it out, but relative energy deficiency in sport is what it stands for because it started out as kind of the female athletic triad, which is still there, but, but they encompassed a whole range of bodily issues that can occur when we don't take in enough food for our output. And the way that I think about it is, 
is when Michael Phelps was swimming and training for the Olympics, he needed something like 7,000 calories a day, right? So if he was only taking in 5,000 calories a day, which for me or you would be almost, we could do it, right? Maybe for a day. But if we tried to do that for multiple days, taking 5,000 calories, like that would be very difficult for us multiple days over and over again. But for him, he would be undernourished. Mm -hmm. So his body is now at a deficiency. And so that's basically, it's relative to me, relative. Eventually, I would I would have serious health problems if I was taking in 5,000 calories every day and not outputting 5,000 worth of work, which I don't. And so, so for him, though, he's deficient and i think a lot of these gymnasts like we're looking at them as as normal 16 or 17 year olds or whatever age they're doing gymnastics and we're looking at their peers and they're like well the peers don't need this much food and and how are we going to get this into them or, or whatever your problem is i think that it's a big issue and that's what what relative energy is for for an athlete so they struggle to get that in and i think one of the biggest issues with this and what i try to explain to parents is not only is it is it bodily functions and immune system? It's also psychological. So depression and anxiety are a big part of this. And maybe, Christina, you could explain it more. Um, I only see it from a scientific point of view. I think even for a male, like like I struggle sometimes understanding it just because because when I was growing up, like there was no, I didn't care what my body ate. I just ate food and, and played sports. So it, it was different. It was different for me. So maybe you could even explain it more than what I did or, or from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the topic of just like the stigmas around puberty and changing bodies, like, I mean, I distinctly remember one day and this fueled my eating disorder. We were all on balance beam, which today this would be a safe sport violation. But my coach just starts pointing out everyone's bodies and who's getting, pardon my language, but who's getting boobs and a butt. And here I was at 13, 14, and I had grown four inches in that summer. I finally had leaned out. I was this chubby kid. I'd already gotten comments on how I looked thin, which was the, that was the ticket to being like, oh, I don't, I always want to hear this. Like I've never had this kind of positive reinforcement like no one's ever said i look thin so i want that couple that with with being pointed out in front of all of my teammates you know i don't he didn't comment on my body specifically but i watched my older teammates get commented on and i was like oh heck no he he is not like i'm not going to change like that's not going to happen cuz i don't want to be called out which you know again it kind of goes back to that dad joking like i'm sure he was just trying to be funny but you know i've talked to a lot of male coaches and they they realize they're like i just i can't say those things and i'm like no you can't because like our female brain doesn't take it in jest it, it gets twisted into oh my gosh he thinks i'm fat um i think the other issues too from like a cultural perspective like in some gyms, and again, this is some gyms, not all gyms, there's a very distinctive, like, the little girls group of the 12-year-old prepubescent elite gymnasts who are easy to spot and toss in the air and all have the same setting. And then there's the old lady group where we got to move the bars, we got to spot them, maybe we don't have a coach that can spot them. Like, those are in-gym cultural issues that, like, yeah, if you have an older crop of gymnasts that are young women and you don't have a coach strong enough to spot them or the appropriate drills and progressions and whatever, like, that's not their fault. They didn't choose to gain 20 pounds in the last year because of normal growth and development. And so, like Jason said, this, like, pubertal suppression or delayed puberty, which is, like, an endocrine diagnosis, is something that we celebrate and we encourage in this kind of subconscious cultural way, whether it's making comments about having to spot, making comments about having to adjust the equipment, or even just comments about, you know, bodies changing, um, whether that's kind of voiced to the gymnast or not. So yeah, it's a, you know, being a woman is hard. It is, it's really hard. And then, you know, couple body change during puberty with like the hormonal all over the place, you know, she's crying one moment and you're like, oh my God, what did I do? 
is she hurt? Like, what's going on? It's like, no, we're just, we're just PMSing. Like, it's fine. She just give her a moment. But, you know, that's a young gymnast can't introspect and understand that. You know, as a young woman, a young woman, I can understand like, wow, I'm having some really irrational thoughts right now. Oh, it's about to be my time of the month. I'm just PMSing, whatever. But like, a 14 to 16 year old gymnast has no idea what's going on in their body. All they know is now I look different in a leotard. Now my skills feel different. Now I look different than my, you know, 12 year old phenom teammate who I always was just as good as. And now I can't keep up with her or my body doesn't look like my gymnast idol's body who unbeknown to me has a raging eating disorder. And that's why she looks like she does. But in my mind, she is the ideal. And if I don't look like her, my gymnastics won't be like hers. And that again, is that like adolescent development? If this is X, X equals Y, you know? So yeah. And yes. And I want to, I want to jump in here too, because I think we're talking a lot about how it's like so focused on male on females, but I'll be completely honest that like, this is a huge issue in the male culture as well. And I'm someone who definitely, when I was younger in my like 18 to 22 year old, you know, college years, I definitely had disordered eating and probably had an undiagnosed eating disorder because in, in the male's gymnastics side, when you look at like the Olympics, you just see shredded, right? These dudes, are eight, they're huge. And like, if you're not that you feel terrible about yourself. So I just grew up in a family that just didn't have great nutritional practices. They weren't mean about it. It wasn't malicious. It's like, that wasn't something that my family was, was promoted about. And so I went to college and I went from my little small pond to the college world. And I saw like all my teammates were just ripped. Right. And I was like, Oh my God, I gotta, I gotta get my stuff together here. So I was eating really poorly. I was doing what I read on like bodybuilding magazine. Right. I was like running an extra hour before practice, taking my own poison, right. Doing the worst thing possible. And my coaches were still just like offhanded comments. Like, you know, if we just got you a little bit leaner, blah, blah, blah. But like, there was never anybody who offered me professional help with nutrition or gave me good advice. It was just like, nah, you know, we'll just let it go. And I had horrible depression and anxiety for it. And I'll, and when I was the leanest I'd ever been, I was 8% body fat and I was the most unhealthy I've ever been in my life, right? Mm-hmm. Lean does not equal healthy, nor does fit equal healthy, right? I was mm-hmm. mentally and emotionally awful, but I was like shredded and I was doing great. You know what I mean? So like the guy, there's going to be hopefully guys listen to this podcast. I hope they do because like it is just as much a problem on the men's side, but stigma in society in America doesn't promote it that way. It shares the message that like, just be tough and gritted out and lift more weights and like, oh, you'll be fine. Just like, stop, stop complaining about it, you know? And so it's very real on the other side. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll say to that. I mean, that's why Red S, you know, they shifted from the female athlete triad to encompass mm-hmm. males. Cause like, we know it. that they have Red mm-hmm. S, they struggle with eating disorders. And I'll say, I mean, go check out my Instagram. Like my whole brand is pink. It's female (laughs) gymnast. Like it's, that's just, you know, that's who I speak to. But I get direct messages from male gymnasts that are like, oh my gosh, thank you for saying these things. Thank you for bringing attention. And it's, it always catches me off guard because right, I'm a female. Like I'm just in my own brain most of the time. Mm. And that's when you realize like they are struggling just like these females. It's sometimes different, but not always. There's a lot of overlap. Yeah. So I just, I wonder, like, you know, we're struggling with the females and supporting them and changing the culture. But like, I feel like for males, we are just really far behind in terms of supporting them and, and probably even having a lot of these conversations since, like you said, as a male, like the stigma is just so much greater, but in different ways, Mm. you know? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. If we have any male, former male gymnasts that are now nutritionists, reach out to me and we'll do a podcast separately and try to tackle part two of this, but yeah, very good. Um, I just want to share one. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah. I just want to throw out a quick name. So um, I'm going to probably say his last name wrong, but Adam Tenford, T-E-N-F-O-R-D-E. He is a researcher up in the Boston area who's done a lot of research to bring this kind of male equivalent of the female athlete triad to the forefront. Um, And so he would be a great person to bring on here to talk about this concept because he's really been at the forefront of this concept. Nice. Twitter world, do your thing. Get on there and and look up together. Um, Yeah. So I want to share this. The last thing we'll talk about with the, this is a really, another really important part of the article that I found on like related menarchy. And I want to link this to injuries because I had a really good discussion about growth plates, but then also Jill Cook is an Achilles tendon researcher. And we had a discussion about why so many uh, female college gymnasts might be tearing their uh, Achilles. And so this was from the first part of this article. This is the same thing, the uh, the nutrition recommendations, 2016. So 
this essentially is talking about red s and the prominence of red s in women's gymnastics and it says later onset of menarche um, between 14 and 16 years old is the norm this can lead to a delay in bone mineral uh, accretion gathering i think that's means sorry uh, and deter the attenuation of peak bone mass in adolescent gymnasts it is possible a female gymnast is an actual age of 15 years old but to have a skeletal age of 13 to 13 and a half and then down here, which is the most important for me, it says the most likely interpretation of increased bone mineral density, because some gymnasts do in studies show increased bone mineral density with impact loading, but they can still have immaturity. So it says the most likely interpretation is the extremely high level of relative muscle mass per kilograms of body weight that these athletes develop. On the other hand, the increased lean body mass explains in part the increased frequency of injuries of bone injuries because the increased bone density is there, but their bones are functionally immature and they have large muscular strength veins. So what's this saying essentially is that with red ass, red delayed menarche, you might have all this hypertrophy of the muscle pulling on very weak, immature bones that have not accumulated all the bone mineral density that they need to. Right. And the reason I bring this up is because you think about the astronomical amount of data that supports stress fractures and growth plate injuries in gymnastics. Maybe a huge issue we have here is again, the, the mismanaged dosage of workload combined with some undertones of red S that is undiagnosed causing a lack of that, that, that recovery mode to happen. You can't lay down your bone like a normal healthy uh, going through puberty gymnast should. So you don't have bone mineral density and you get these growth plate injuries, you get these stress fractures, you get these spondy fractures and stuff like that. Training load plus, you know, you know, what repetition issues and loading plus nutritional, there's no actual scaffolding to hold these muscles tightly to the bone. And it was so interesting because Jill Cook on the podcast, and this was unprovoked. She just said this. She said some of the research that might suggest might possible of why there's so many Achilles tears in the college world is that when they're younger, the same thing uh, is a risk factor for collagen being laid down. So, right. If you are not maybe getting a full nutritional profile, the right amount of calories for your energy uh, demand, you're chronically in a deficit. You don't have the raw materials to build collagen tissue that can be laid down. And she was saying that a lot of uh, people accumulate all their collagen and their Achilles in other places before 16. So you think about those training years up to 16, if you don't have the raw materials, the training load balance, and we're not encouraging a slightly later specialization or a later peak training hours, as Josh has said before, maybe someone is not laying down their full collagen. They're doing double pikes at 13 and they're doing your tranquil fulls and stuff. They go through the normal stages of puberty and then they flip the trigger into I'm in the, I've gotten beaten up in my career, but now I go to a super dense college season where I'm competing back to back to back weekends. I'm a floor and vault specialist. I'm no longer doing beam. So I'm more on floor and vault. And now they're doing double layouts or full ends back to back weekends. Maybe the problem is the age 10 to 15, where we didn't give them the right environment to lay down their bone and lay down their collagen. I think that's a super plausible one possible factor of why we have 25 spontaneous Achilles ruptures in the first month of the 2020 season. Like that's in my opinion, a huge part of it. So I would really like to hear if anybody has thoughts on that before we move on, but. I'll say that, you know, my first job was in a pediatric endocrinology clinic and we would get referrals for both male and females who weren't growing. And those appointments were always linked appointments between the endo and myself. And they obviously would look at all the medical stuff. They'd order a bone age. They would check labs. And then they relied on me to do the nutritional assessment to see, you know, where are we in terms of energy availability? And, you know, that that's a very prominent referral for a pediatric endocrinology clinic, right? Like a pediatrician sees the child at a well check, notices they're not growing, they're not gaining weight, they're smaller than their peers, they get sent to endocrinology, and it gets taken care of. Yet in the sports world, especially gymnastics, like, a lot of this comes from just miseducation. Like a lot of pediatricians I hear are like, oh, you're just a gymnast, you know, you'll, you'll just be small. Your growth is just delayed. You'll catch up when you quit. Like same thing with periods, right? Like I get a gymnast, she's 17, she hasn't had a period. Instead of being told that's not normal, she's just told, oh, it's the stress of the sport. You know, when you quit, it'll be fine. And so to me, it's just an interesting contrast between most of the medical community recognizes delayed puberty, delayed bone age, all of these things as like a medical diagnosis, which is what the article talked about. Like that athlete should be treated like they're injured, even mm -hmm. though there may not be like a tangible injury. Yep. Yet in gymnastics society, whether it's the parents or the pediatricians or just other providers who just aren't aware, um, we still kind of have that generally accepted notion of well you know it's just gymnastics like it's just 
It's mm. just the way it is. Mm. Yeah, Jason? Yeah, it's like you're normalizing yeah. insanity. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and so when you're in the middle of the culture, you think this is how it's supposed to be because everyone around you is doing it. So I guess it's normal. And you never have that experience of like, this is what science is and this is so so you don't have that especially as an athlete who's like 13 you don't have the basis of comparison even adults parents don't know either right the parents rely on the coaches and the other people for the advice so if they're not getting good advice what do they what do the parents know unless they've had that personal experience have been a gymnast let's say and so i think it's um it's an insane thing. There's another point I wanted to make, and I totally forgot <laughs> when I had the insanity comment. So I'll, okay. I'll wait. When yeah, Jack, you want to me? Chat, so. Yeah, I think that on that, and this might jump into the next one too. But one of the things that the one of the first interactions I had with an elite gymnast, I was working with her on her low back pain, and she went to to Lucan's old gym, and and I guess my you might be able to figure out by process of elimination who it was, but. Uh, she came in, I just talked to her mom because she's having back pain. And so I always go through my, my athlete pyramid, which you can see behind me, but you know, how's your nutrition look like? And the mom got really quiet and, and she just said, she's like, well, uh, whenever she, my daughter said, Jim, the coaches always tell her, go home and eat dinner like a bird. So you should have your chicken breast and your salad, and then you should go to sleep. And I was like, Oh, no, 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 that's not the way that it should be. I'm like, this is what you should be eating after practice. You know, you should, this is your most important time to get your carbohydrates in because you're storing them and you're getting ready for the next day's practice, all this information. And, and the mom was like, oh, well, if we do that, then that's going against what the coach says. And, uh, and the owner, who's a little bit, you know, not my favorite owner in the world, but she goes, Dr. Eldridge, if you say that, you're going to get blackballed from gymnastics. And I'm like, blackballed i all i said was like this comes straight from the academy of dietetics and or nutrition and dietetics position paper i'm like i didn't make this stuff up this weekend like i'm just reading from the position paper and so that's kind of the that's the thought process in in gymnastics and that's one of the things that makes it incredibly sad that yeah. that that's kind of the way things go and the way that we think about nutrition yeah and just one more point kind of on a global level about how there's an opportunity here to just tear apart what we think is is normal in our in our culture and there's an opportunity here and um there's so many things that we've talked about but i've talked with all of you guys about and i've talked with multiple other people about it's just like why are we doing this why are we still doing this what in the world and clearly athlete a has shown us what happened money power status medals that's why we're doing it right and so it's not everybody but a lot of the top-down culture spread that's not just in the u.s but the whole world again 20 minutes before this podcast i watched two other countries rip apart their entire thing that's happening in the u.s right why are we still saying tra training hours shouldn't equal age josh has been saying this for five years right why shouldn't we say till 10 12 years old you shouldn't do more than your hours why don't we late specialize why don't we use strength conditioning why don't we use interdisciplinary care with real nutritionists? Why don't we use proper flexibility methods? Why don't we entertain mental health more seriously? Why don't we actually listen to the gymnasts when they're younger and get their bed? All these things that are like basics in other sports. Why are we doing it? Because everybody surrounded themselves with people who were yesing themselves to death. There was no diversity of opinions. There was nobody who had a spine to stand up and say, no, that's not okay. Nobody who had real courage to say, listen, as a coach to coach, your best friend may be growing up like, hey man, you're going off the rails here a little bit. Like you shouldn't be saying that because there's no check and accountability for what we're doing. And there's also no standard education. I got on Harper. And again, you need two year degree to start coaching to make sure you're not messing kids up and you should be doing con ed units every single year to make sure you're doing the latest and greatest stuff. So everybody has blame here. There's nobody that can point a finger instead of pulling a thumb. Everyone's guilty, myself included of making mistakes like this, but this is why we're in this mess. And so the pandemic athlete, a no training maybe is probably going to happen in terms of competition for at least another six months before we get whatever's happening with COVID maybe this year. Now is your time to just completely start over. And then we're doing this in our gym. We're completely starting over with, we're not following USAG's comp schedule. We're doing it how we want to do it. We're following the research. We're following what we do. And if we completely blow it for a year, totally fine. I'm rather my kids be healthy and us tinkering with a new model to come out than being like, nah, let's just slowly slide back downhill into the same stuff we always do. So there's an opportunity here. If you listen to this podcast and you feel like you're like lit on fire by how upset athlete a made you start really like kicking the door in for change. And if it's not a good fit in your gym, leave, go to a different gym, start your own gym, move somewhere, go anywhere else, right? Don't just keep living in a toxic culture because we got to stuff these minority few gyms and few people out that are propagating these terrible ideas. So 
rent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just I was just going to piggyback on that. I mean, I, you know, I had a situation a couple months ago where I, I get an athlete, she's told she needs to quote work on her nutrition, aka your fat in the ears of a a 15-year-old. Um, you know, coaches meet with parents and gymnasts every three months warning them they're going to get kicked off the team if they don't follow this certain look and strength and the rest. And I had to, I had to check myself. Like I had to seek out some of my mentors and I told this family, I said, maybe this isn't my place, but you need to move gyms. Like there's a whole lot of other stuff going on, but what in my mind was abusive and again, like, mm-hmm. I'm just a dietitian, like, I'm just talking about nutrition here, but you're telling me all these other things that like, yeah, I'm not a coach, but like, that's not right. And the mom was like, oh my gosh, like, I kind of thought that some of these things were kind of weird. She's like, but when you're in it and this is what you know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's it. Like that right there is just the perfect image of the culture where there's grumblings, like, some of these parents are like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I sure. But then it's like my gymnast has these dreams and I want to support her and we're fearing the consequences. Right. Just like you said, Josh, like you're going to be blackballed. Like you're going to be asked to leave. Like, yeah, it's just kind of a side note to what you just said, Dave. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the other kind of glaring, like, not saying something does not make you innocent, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, very well said. Jason, you want to continue without there before we tackle that one? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the story of athlete A and, and Maggie was the exact thing. They, they felt tied to it, right? They felt trapped. They couldn't get out of it because ultimately this was her dream to get to where she wanted to be. And that if she went against this, that ultimately she would be shunned which unfortunately she did um and so when you have this culture that's stacked against you it is tremendously challenging for an individual to feel like you're stacked against this kind of huge system Mm -hmm. it's it's nearly impossible um so i appreciate that challenge in how a single parent or single athlete can feel like this is beyond their scope and that's why the culture needs to change the one other thought i had was why aren't there or if they were if if this is happening i am not well aware of it is there effective pre-participation screening yearly within the gymnastics world as far as are you growing are these things happening? Are you feel like, you know, to be able to participate in this next year is exactly like, like baseball every year or basketball, every sport. So maybe some pre-participation. Screening would be good. Is probably yes, but not in the 90% of the world. Yeah. So just another thought to add to that, that, that great list you had, Dave. Yeah, sure. That was one of my thoughts too. Maybe add some of those things into, so always in gymnastics, if you can do a certain skill or you can get a certain score, then you can progress up to the next level or you just have to do the level and progress up to the next level. My thought was, why don't you have, especially in the younger, uh, lower levels, why don't you have some type of skill that you have to complete? You have to be able to show before you can move on to a higher level, you know, dismount from being, you have to show us that you can land properly. So why isn't that, why isn't there a skill test that mm-hmm. go along? And then you have your judges look at the skill test and they understand, hey, this is your proper landing position. This is how we protect ourselves, you know, a fall or, or whatever things that, that we think about are, are good, but add that into it. Yeah, I've thought about that before, Jason. I think that that's a great thought. Yeah. I can't believe that doesn't happen. It, you know, even from a nutrition <laughs> perspective, may, maybe not the coaches, but the parents of like, if you're not going <laughs> to eat before practice, you're not going to go to practice. And not from like a, this athlete has an eating disorder, but just like, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, because we all know it, right? Like a lot of gymnasts don't like to eat. They don't want to feel heavy. They don't want to look bloated, but it's like, we wouldn't let you go to bars without your grips. So why are we letting you walk into the gym just totally under fueled and dehydrated? Slash a page out of Josh's book is, you know, why wouldn't you take a 15 minute break to get some grapes or some fruit in you halfway through the practice if you're going to do a four hour training practice? Like, like you know, in science supports that. And I tell parents that all the time. I say, after we do this, after we do this presentation tonight, I said, I hope that your coaches, if your daughter or son comes into gym and they haven't had their pre-workout snack, or 
if they haven't had breakfast, mid morning snack, lunch, pre workout snack, like they're not allowed in the gym. Why would the gym take the risk? Like yeah. to me, it's like for the gym, why are they going to take the risk of having a kid that either forgot their water bottle at home, so now they're dehydrated, or they're not taking in just basic a uh, pre workout snack that that's uh, even if it's something small, like start off small, but don't let your kids into the gym if they're not eating properly. I love that, Christina. That yeah, that, yeah there should be a that, but that's just the intestinal fortitude of the gym saying, "Hey, we're not gonna we're not gonna stand for this." And they kick them out of the gym a couple times. Mom and dad are gonna get ticked. They're gonna be like, "Why? Why am I here at three thirty picking you up? Like again? Why am I paying?" Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, then, that's one of the ways too that I feel like coaches can empower and talk about nutrition. Like same thing as you do, Josh. Like I do a lecture series and I go into a gym. And after we're done, I tell the coaches, like, you now know what appropriate performance, nutrition, and hydration is, and you have the authority to enforce that. And that's not you saying that's good or bad. That's just an objective. Did you have pre-workout nutrition? Are you hydrating? Did you bring a mid-workout snack? So on and so forth. And I, I feel like that's a huge role that coaches can play. But on the same note, right now with COVID, right? Like, I have a lot of gyms right now that aren't allowing anything in the gym. Their girls aren't going back to the locker rooms. Maybe they can have water. So I'm over here like covertly telling these high level gymnasts like, all right, I need you to add some carbs to your water bottle. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're afraid they're going to get in trouble or I have other gyms where they're not allowed to have snacks for four hours. The coach has just decided they don't need them or they've made too much of a mess in the locker room and they couldn't clean it up. So the punishment is you just don't get to bring snacks, which I understand that, but like, this is performance we're talking about and that's just kind of the wrong consequence. So anyways. Yep. Yeah. Super well said. Good there. I'm, I'm conscious of everyone's time. So I want to get to this last one and wrap it up because it's almost nine 30 here in uh, the East coast. So this is amazing so far. And I think the longer form discussion is what is, is needed to happen. So thank you for all your time, but let's tackle the last one. That is definitely, we've already touched on it a few times, but we know this is a huge issue is, um, you know, why the advice of either no or low carb or no or low fat, it's, it's just really, really poorly guided. And honestly, I had this as like epiphany, maybe a few days ago of reading this research, but I was like, I feel like some coaches, parents, gymnasts themselves would be like, I'll just eat protein all the time and I should be fine. Like, I think some people literally think like if I have a salad and protein all day long, I'll just be superhuman because shape up magazine says no carbs and no fat. Right. So I should, what am I left with protein and uh, my multivitamin? That sounds like it's a good source of food. You know what I mean? So what, and especially in an, aer an anaerobic sport, why is that advice not good? Right. What's the science behind that? And, um, then we'll go into what we can do instead. So anybody want to tackle that one first? I'm sure. You guys can all just destroy this one easy, but. <laughs> well, I was just going to speak to, you know, I was on USAG's Athlete Wellness Committee in 2017, and we were revamping this athlete's wellness course that had sleep, the psych stuff, it had the team doctor that was at St. Vincent's, all the things. And we got a copy of the 1999 Athlete's Wellness Handbook that had tons of nutrition pulled from a lot of these research papers that we're seeing. Obviously, back in the 90s, low fat was the thing. But from like a nutritional perspective, sometimes people go towards low fat just in the context of you need enough protein to spare your lean mass and to provide substrate for adaptation. You need enough carbohydrate to fuel this anaerobic sport. So from a caloric standpoint, that leaves us really the fat portion to modulate if we are needing to make a deficit for some body recomposition. But of course, that gets extrapolated from lower fat, maybe 20 to 25% of calories instead of 30 to 35, to fat makes you fat. And a lot of this just magical thinking, right? Like carbs make you fat, fat makes you fat. Only if you eat clean will you get lean. And there's just some magic combination of the right foods. And if you deviate from that, you know, all hell breaks loose. So anyways, I thought I'd start off with that because obviously yeah. like we look at population nutrition, we've swung the pendulum from the low fat era to now, now we think fat's great and we're putting it on everything and in our coffee and everything else. But now it's, oh my gosh, it's carbs that are the problem, grain brain, 
Mark Hyman, all these experts, you know, the gluten, what is it? Wheat belly, like all these things that now people are just terrified and people don't know what to eat. So like you said, Dave, like protein's safe. No one really goes after protein. I mean, we had a little bit of like, oh, don't t- eat too much protein or it'll kill your kidneys, which obviously is not true. But yeah, it, it leaves families with like, well, protein and vegetables, because that's all I know to eat. So. Ice it is. Ice all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Josh, we're so anyways, continue on. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, you know, especially as an anaerobic sport, for the most part, gymnastics, is that the only thing that's really readily available to a gymnast is what's stored in their muscle is glycogen. So, so not to take in those carbohydrates means that you don't actually want to do anything in gym. So you want to, you want to like go to gym and, and like bonk after your first, your first 30 minutes, because you haven't taken in those, those carbohydrates. And that's one of my favorite things too, Christina, that I ask the coaches, like, cause they're always there for the, the uh, gym, gymnast presentation too. And, and I always just say, coach, What's it like when you see one of your athletes come in and they haven't had their pre-workout snack or they haven't had anything carbohydrates throughout the day? And it's so much fun because they all say very similar things is that the girls have horrible attitudes when they come in. They Their fears are exploded because the number one utilizer of carbohydrates is the is the nervous system. And so so we've got all of these these things that we don't want in a gymnast all come from not taking in carbohydrates. So, right. so the things that we want is we want a gymnast to be able to, to explode and do big movements and, and spend those, those 10 to 15 seconds or, or up to, you know, two minutes doing their routine hardcore. And then we want them to have really good attitudes. And then we want them to remember everything that we taught them. And then, I don't know, whatever else you want from an athlete, it, it all takes carbohydrates to get there. Right. And, Right. So that's one of the the things. The issue is, you know, we have like nutritionists in our realm who want to argue against the basic physiological principle that carbohydrate is a substrate that fuels anaerobic metabolism. I mean, I had a nutritionist I had to work with on this committee who said that a high level gymnast should have eggs and avocado before practice. And I looked at her, you know, here I am, I'm a pediatric endocrinology dietitian. I'm a certified diabetes educator. Like I lived this in terms of blood sugar regulation. I look at her and I'm like, there's a difference between calories and being full and eating a meal versus actually, you know, fueling for the work required. And I know you may be terrified of carbs yourself. I was for a long time, but like, you don't get to make up the science. I'm sorry. Like it, you know, people try, but you just don't. So, and the other thing too is if we don't get, and I'm probably stepping on some things here, but but if we don't take in carbohydrates after practice, so we need them before practice because that kind of fuels. But if we don't take them in after practice for dinner, then we're not preparing for the next day's practice. So we're kind of putting ourselves behind. So if yep. we we got to think about carbohydrates as our friend, and and do we want to eat? you know, candy and things like that. That's not the time we want to take in those really good quality stuff, but they can be delicious. Like we don't have to, we don't have to like, like Dave and Dave was talking about Sarah's tacos before, like you can have really amazing food that tastes really good, but it, but it also gives us the fuel that we need to, to make sure that we want to do what we want to do. So as athletes. Yeah. Super well said, Jason, you got anything on that? I feel like you're, you're diving in. Uh, I, I like to take notes because everyone has such great points. I like to take notes as my thoughts pop up. Um, one thing is, yeah, so, you know, the brain comment from Josh, it's so important, so well said. And the idea that just in general, the higher the intensity of an effort or an activity, the more percentage of that fuel is coming from carbohydrates. It's proven. The higher the intensity, the more percentage of those calories are coming from carbs. So if you don't have them, what are you going for? not getting it. Um, I think in some cases for the athletes who are there, I think, again, it's like a normalized depletion. In other words, if everyone's coming in on low glycogen every day, they don't know what feeling good feels like Mm -hmm. until the injury, until the time they have to stop. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't know it could be like this. And then they learn, hopefully, if the culture doesn't beat them back down. Um, 
on the the like the other dietitian, right? Like I think we also need to really make sure that we are not projecting ourselves mm -hmm. and our thoughts and our experiences on our athletes because hey, I'm not training four to six hours a day. I get that. I get that I don't need to be eating that amount of carbs, but I'm not them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another major factor, especially when we're interacting again with those younger athletes. Um, so I think those are just some feedback points that, that you know, I thought of when everyone was speaking, but I think everything that Josh and Christina has said are spot on. Yeah, totally. And I'll sing, I'll sing, I'm going to sing Josh's praises because I, I think I know what story you're going to tell right now. <laughs> Wrong. Josh had a story where he worked with someone and the mom was like training for a marathon or was going like crazy with calorie deficit and literally just copy pasting the diet to the daughter, right? Oh, God. Error on the parent side. Like if you're reading Dr. Oz and you're putting these things into your kid who's doing gymnastics 20 hours a week, it's going to be a disaster waiting to happen. But Josh, you can say whatever. Yeah, that was great. I wasn't thinking about that, but that's fantastic. That was a great story. 1,500 calories is what she dropped down to, which I'm still trying to figure out how you train for a marathon at 1,500 calories. But it was like, it, I couldn't believe it because we just did like a, uh, because the daughter was struggling so much. We weren't worried about her weight or anything like that, but she was struggling so much in gymnastics with like overuse injuries, red S pretty much. She was, she was like the, the, the poster child for that. And, and so I just like, they did a, they just did a journal of the, of the diet and I'd never seen anything like it before. Like every, like I'm calculating this. I'm like, how is this even possible? Like they're nailing 1500 calories every single day. Exactly. And, and so I just kind of sat the mom down. I'm like, "Hey, your daughter needs this many calories to sit on the couch and and play video games like all day and and nothing else. Plus, you're adding four hours of gymnastics four days a week. Like, how how do you want the? This is the only possible conclusion that can happen. So, um, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of very interesting. But as soon as the coolest thing about that, she just started adding in food throughout the day, and she jumped up. I think. And it doesn't really matter the, the the calories. She just started increasing, taking in more carbohydrates, more food throughout the day. And she started growing. She turned into the best gymnast on the team, which was so cool in about in about a year and a half. So she made this like complete turnaround where the coaches were like, we don't even want her in the gym because she's not very good to this is the best athlete in the gym or one of the best athletes in the gym. So it was so cool. And and Jason, what you said, one of the things I love to say to parents when we're doing this is is I challenge them, take take two weeks and work out for four hours a day for two weeks and then come back and tell me what you're eating. Because I'm telling you right now, if I worked out for four hours a day for two weeks, I would eat everything in this house plus possibly the house. So <laughs> like there is no way I go out. I did a 17 mile bike ride before this and I had dinner before. After we get done with this, I'm probably going to have another dinner because I'm going to be hungry again. Just because, and that's, that was an hour and 15 minutes of work. Like, like that's not even anywhere near what these kids are doing. Nowhere near. And they're putting out so much energy and people just think that, that they don't need more food and more intake, but, but these, these young ladies and men are working so hard and they need to fuel their bodies like that. And we gotta, we gotta leave them alone. And, and I, I just, anybody that that's struggling with that concept just needs to go work out for four hours a day for two weeks after you check with your doctor to make sure you're healthy enough to do it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. the last thing, I, one thing I want to point out, because Christina, you sent me the articles on it, and I think they make really good points, is that you will see isolated articles of saying, we put people on these low-carb diets. We put people on these keto diets. We put them on them for a month. They lost a bunch of weight, and they didn't get worse. I'm like, 30 days is not the be all and end all. 30 days is just enough to show I can get a little bit better. And then you put them on for a year and then they crash and burn and then they get injured and then they're screwed. And so I think you, we really need to be aware when we look at articles, especially if we're not educated in this, that we're not, we need to read the methods. We need to understand the science of what, like 30 days is not proof that you can do this as a sustained training method. Mm. So again, we need to not just cherry pick to fit our own conclusions. We need to actually understand the science or talk to someone who does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I recommend I think, just, I recommend people too, just to take a, take a quick glance. It's in a super easy read. I love it is, and it's the, the position paper by, by the, um, the Academy of Dietetics and Nutrition. 
Like they've got a great, just on, on athlete nutrition. It's not an incredibly hard read. If you just search for, for that and position paper for athletes and, and you can't necessarily nice, <laughs> you can't necessarily extrapolate everything down to kids, but there's a lot of just great information in there for, for kids. And this is what I base anything I tell to, to a parent or a coach or, or this is what I base it on. So, cause I just think it's got such great information. Cool. Yeah. Christina, anything, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Yeah. I mean, I think the last point on just this, like food fears, like low fat, low carb, carbs are bad. You know, uh, I try to do a lot of educating because for me personally, like part of my recovery from an eating disorder was understanding fluctuations in the scale, understanding body composition, understanding that whether it's, you know, the sugar in Gatorade or the sugar in the fruit, like the body knows what to do. It's going to utilize it. The difference obviously is quality which then just gets down into vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and, and perhaps, you know, digestion absorption rates. But it's not that any of these foods are, are just, like I said earlier, like magical. And, and that's our culture. I mean, our culture is, you know, don't eat bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, because they literally will just stick to you like fat. Obviously, 10, 20 years ago, you know, don't eat fat, because again, it just literally sticks to your body. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, we all fall prey to this, right? Like the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And when I talk to parents and coaches alone, I, I tell them, I said, you have to role model. Your gymnast can't see you on a diet. Your gymnast can't see you, you know, pushing food around your plate or refusing certain food groups, especially if that's what you're asking them to do. You know, you, you can't be on your keto diet and cause now they're getting mixed messages, right? Like, your actions are more powerful than your words. Um, there's a funny thing I saw on Twitter the other day, just kind of more on the topic of weight, but I'm going to say it. This, she was a nurse and she was like, I was in the bathroom and I stepped on the scale and my five-year-old walked in and said, oh, mommy, is that what tells you how beautiful you are? Oh. Like that right there, like kids, I mean, we've got eating disorders in girls that are eight years old. Like, I, you know, I'm not a parent yet. I am terrified in the realm of like nutrition and body. Cause obviously I, I see some of the worst of it, but yeah, it's just, there's so many factors, right? So much education. And I tell these gyms, like the gyms who, you know, bring you in, Josh, bring me in. Like that is a low cost, large reaching effort that the booster clubs that can support, like parents can support that back the coaches, provide the education for the coaches, provide it for the gymnast. It makes it easier to when a gymnast is struggling, they can go visit with that same dietitian they saw. And now it's not as much of a stigma because they've already been there. You know, it's, it's not like, oh, well, Susie needs to go see the dietitian because that's always going to get taken in the light of like, oh, gosh, they think I'm fat. But if that person's actively involved in the gym and this conversation is ongoing, again, it's that rapport. It's just things we need to structurally have in place for our gyms, for our coach education, et cetera, that really make a big difference when, when things get sticky. So yep. anyways. Yeah. Super well said. And I'm just going to share this last little science piece that we had in terms of glycogen. And I want everyone to have a chance to pr uh, sing their praises of where people can find you because this is already super long and I really appreciate your guys' time. This is, we've gone two hours and I'm sure we could go two more. I'm going to bed. I'm sure all of you are too. But uh, this was from the study and it just says, um, it's a recommendation, but the daily carbohydrate intake should be increased to six grams per kilogram. And I think my math is wrong. That could be 12 to 13 grams per pound. I think somebody fact checked me on that. That's like you know, just a, a range for us American friends, um, in order to ensure optimal glycogen stores and the next day's training should take place within safe energy limits. Female gymnasts have a permanent deficit, quote unquote, of glycogen due to their long daily and weekly duration of their training. So essentially saying that that's a significant amount of carbs <laughs> for anybody who's curious, well, that's a lot of carbs. So unless you guys have a different opinion on that, I think that's a really good thing to kind of end the science in our talk on about like the science of what it really says versus what probably is getting propagated in the culture. Gonna be Debbie down. I'm gonna, we're gonna fact check. So it's actually gonna divide the six by two point two because the body weight in pounds is higher. Oh, so okay. it's gonna be yeah. a smaller number. Gotcha. That you're multiplying I think I by because I had I, um, because I, I think I can't even imagine doing the math of like twelve times one hundred twenty pounds or something. That's um, what I was <laughs>
And that's kind of what I was referring to is it's difficult, <laughs> not impossible, right, Jason? Difficult for the, for the athletes to take in that much, that much food in order to, to ha- at least, at least as far as performance based, like it's difficult for them to do everything else in their life and take in that much food. Like, and, and that's why just getting back to where we started, the whole thought process behind training needs to be, be rethought and and reimagined and and change the way that we're doing things to make it more uh, efficient for the athlete to succeed so if we're just gonna if we're gonna make it very difficult for them to succeed then we can't blame it on the athlete when they break so well said so well said Mm -hmm. awesome well that does it man i can't thank you guys enough for all we've done but let's go quick brady bunch again where can people find you um what do you guys got up to so jason what's going on with you yeah, so I work at um, Hospital for Special Surgery, uh, Orthopedic Hospital in New York City, um, hss.edu. Um, I'm sure they'll be thrilled that I'm making the plug. Um, so I also have the pleasure of working with an awesome doctor, Dr. Alan Casey, physiatrist who, who does great, great work with gymnastics, uh, with just athletes in general. Um, so yeah, I am a dietitian and exercise physiologist. I work with people both from the nutrition standpoint as a sports dietitian, also for training that movement perspective, like kind of moving correctly is a lot of what we do. Um, so yep. Um, yeah, my, I don't know if you're saying email addresses, my email address is last name, first initial at hss.edu. If I get questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I'm sure you will. (laughs) How about Josh? What do you got, buddy? Yeah, fantastic. So you can find me over at sportsperformance.academy. And and that's where if you go to gymnastcare.com, it'll just forward you on there to sportsperformance.academy, where we just talk a lot about, about especially like my pyramid here. How do we layer things to make sure that our athletes can succeed? And and I think when we get the right things in the right order, that's where, where we get it. So you can go there, shoot me a message, or doc at gymnastcare.com. You can you can send me or any of the social media sites. Come on over, check awesome. us out. Wait, Christina. Yeah, you can find me on my website at christinaandersonrdn.com. Um, you can contact me there. I'm pretty active on Instagram as well. It's the dot gymnast dot nutritionist. Um, but yeah, I I work with high level gymnasts to help them find food freedom plus elite performance because. You know, though it is about fueling for performance, I believe that food also has to be enjoyed. Like it's social, it's cultural, emotional, and there's no reason that an athlete can't experience the highest level of elite performance while fueling appropriately, but still enjoying their lives and what they eat. So awesome. Well, guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We went over unexpectedly, but um, yeah, anybody who's listening to this, listen to it twice, take notes, share it with everybody. Cause like, man, we hit on so many things that I think for the first time ever in my career, we've actually addressed real issues. To be honest, I think we're actually doing things that are helpful. So kudos to you guys and we will see everybody in another episode. All right. Have a good night guys. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Christina. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye, Josh, Jason.